Good. Are we all in order? That's great. All right. Um, all of our members are here except for Vanessa, although she did tell me that she would be coming. She may be en route. She's en route. Yes, she's probably lived the furthest. <laughs> yes. OK, um, the next item. Oh, thank you. The next item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance and the flag is over here. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Oh, well done, lady. Oh, hey. nice job. Hey. Welcome, Vanessa. <laughs> um, all right. Um, welcome, everyone, to the Community Library Network Board of Trustees. Um, regular meeting that is open to the public. As we have done for years, we are taking our meetings out to the smaller libraries. Um, the purpose is to give board members a chance to see the libraries and these communities and to allow managers to show off their libraries. Um, in order to accommodate as much of the public as possible, we are meeting when the libraries are closed for operations. Um, so I would like to remind us all again that these meetings are not public meetings. They are board meetings that are open to the public. Um, public comment. Let's see. Let me see. Here. I've got it. Um, public comment is not required um, by law at 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 these meetings, um, but we certainly want to offer it. But to this, we had and we've had a really difficult time the last few months because public comment has taken up as much as half of our meetings. So we have not been able to get our work done. So to this end, um, we have put a time limit of 30 minutes of public comment to each regular board meeting. But uh, and we've also added 30 minutes, 30 minutes to the time of our regular board meeting. So we're now meeting for three and a half hours instead of three. Um, and many other agencies also have put these kinds of regulations in place on public comment from the legislature down to Idaho Falls Public Library has 15 minutes of public comment. Meridian Public Library has chosen to have none. Um, we aren't going to start public comment until after this, until after these pre comments. And we will not cut someone off if they're if at the end of the 30 minutes, someone's still talking. We will certainly let them finish and we will use up all the 30 minutes. So if we have a few minutes left over, we will make sure that somebody else is allowed to talk, even if we go over by a few minutes. Um, I'll read to you a little bit from the policy, as I always do. The Community Library Network Board of Trustees operates under the Idaho uh, Code Open Meeting Law, and the board will be pleased to take comments under advisement. We will not be responding at this meeting. Comments may also be submitted by writing, um, or uh, by writing in addition to, you know, oral presentation. And the board is committed to conducting its meetings in a civil, orderly, efficient, and productive manner. Please sign in before speaking, which people have, giving your name and community. And the speaker may address, oh, sorry, um, comments should be addressed directly to the board and not to the audience. A time limit of three minutes is allowed for each speaker. A person may speak one time at the podium during the meeting. In cases of disagreement, the speaker must use grace and tact. Persons addressing the board are expected to observe a level of civility and decorum appropriate for a public meeting. No personal attacks or disruptions from the audience will be tolerated. Um, so with that, the first person on our list is Mariana Cochran. Despite their appeal in a candy dish, there's nothing good about M&M's. Every ingredient in the temple they tempt with the promise of goodness, but after that fleeting indulgence, consumers are worse off for having them. So it's the perfect metaphor for your campaign slogan, Trustees McCray and Meyer, because what could 
be our healthy and nourishing community library network is actually a poison pill for kids. Here's a few examples. Trustee McCray recently quoted, quote, the wheels of government turn slowly, unquote. Well, they certainly do when forced into low gear as you repeatedly dismiss community input opposed to your agenda. For months and months, you ignored, deflected, and denied blatant examples of sexually explicit materials for kids, and your excuse was there wasn't a bureaucratic paper chase submitted. Even Jim, Jim McMall, formerly of ICRIM, implicated you last week, Trustee McCray, when he said, quote, sometimes attorneys are an impediment to transparency, unquote. He's right. Meyer and McCray believe libraries belong to you. Well, that exclamation rings hollow when the true feedback received last summer via the patron survey was suppressed. There were a total of 1,468 comments of which those complaining about the porn in the kids section outnumbered other input by 30%. Yet you did nothing meaningful about that, including last November's loophole-ridden policy revision that even the interim director admitted in January warranted zero collection changes. And this board continued to deny, deflect, and lie that there was, quote, no pornographic materials in the kids' section. In the February 16th board meeting, Trustee Meyer stated, quote, I want to be sure to hear public comment, unquote. Yet in March, Trustees Meyer and McRae reached consensus to limit public comment effective this month. Who's censoring now? Another recent questionable assertion by this board, book purchase requests are 80% accepted. By contrast, I've made 24 almost all juvenile purchase requests since October 2022. Of those, six have been accepted. That's 25%. But close to 80% of my requests were denied, including a series by the wildly popular Tuttle Tuttlers. That's a very clear bias against conservative vote. Yet another claim, M&M implemented youth cards, another lie. In fact, nothing of the sort has been implemented. Instead, you rushed to vote on March 16th, one day before the deadline to file for re-election. The voters will see through that sham of a maneuver because we're spreading the word. Ironically, with the achievement that you hail, you indict yourself as purveyors and defenders of sexually explicit materials for minors. Indeed, your meeting's own recordings captured this repeatedly. And the most laughable of all, Eminem are committed to keeping obscenity out of the library, colossally hollow with zero specificity or planning, disingenuous at best, a lie at worst. So those who want to be healthy and well reject Eminem's as the voters will reject Meyer and McCray. Hanley and Blast for hope for our community's kids. Thank, thank you. Suzanne Kearney. I hope no one wants to go over 30 minutes today because that's what's going to happen. Suzanne Kearney, I live in Close Falls. I'm pleased that trustee Katie Blank has finally admitted that the library distributes questionable content to minors. After all, when commenters read books from the minor section last February, she said, quote, we have allowed people to read absolutely awful passages, end quote. I'm also pleased that trustee Judy Meyer requested one of our clean books for kids flyers because she's now guilty of knowingly distributing explicit content to minors. It seems she took the handout for political strategizing rather than protecting kids' innocence, right? I also assume that by enacting a minor's card policy, the board can see that explicit materials exist. After all, if there were no problem, why are they bragging about their new policy? So let's discuss the new minor's card policy. One, it will potentially change nothing and may in fact cause harm. First, it contains no plan for reclassifying materials. Second, it may give parents a false sense of security, making them less likely to screen their child's checkouts. Why not require parental consent? Since you don't like the term informed consent, call it adult screening. Idaho's Kuna School District is requiring parental approval for quote, behind the shelf materials, no banned books. Do you want to empower parents? The repeated assertions by the board of their legal right to dispense such materials to minors makes me wonder if the new poli policy is just optics, giving trustees running for re-election a glowing headline in the CDA press and the ability to say, see, we did something, while actually doing nothing. The two incumbent trustees have had six years to address this problem. Why did they wait until right before the election to draft this useless policy? Both Meyer and McCray are on recent record claiming that our minor sections are already free from sexually explicit content. Why the new policy then? Is this a token gesture to gain voters trust? Trustee Meyer recently told the CDA press that the library does not promote, quote, political, social, or religious agendas. Fact check, 
the sexualization of children is in fact a political and social agenda. A self-proclaimed globalist, Meyer accuses opponents of authoritarianism as she herself consolidates power under one CLN umbrella from which to indoctrinate our youth. Recently, Idaho's voters spoke through their representatives in Boise, missing a supermajority override of HB 314 by only one vote. In other words, the vast majority of Idahoans do not want sexually explicit materials in their libraries. Who are the real extremists here? Yes, Meyer and McCray have experience. Experience being complicit in the sexualization of our children. Voters need to clean house and vote for Tim and Tom on May 16th. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. Thank you. Um, Charles. What? What is Charles? Here we go. I'm just going to address a couple of. Uh, Propaganda points that were mailed to me recently. The first one is that uh, board trustee candidates, uh, Eminem, Meyer, and McCray implemented youth cards so parents can select access to age appropriate books. That's not true. I was at the library yesterday, and your librarian said that this policy has not been implemented. So either that librarian is lying or the two of you are lying. Second contention was that you've grown the library system from one to seven libraries. Well, I was at the library, as I said yesterday, a librarian there told me that no, not one square foot of library space has been increased over these years. You just absorbed other libraries that already exist. So that's not exactly true either. Uh, the third thing is that you said that the libraries, are you ensure that the libraries serve everyone free from social influences? <clears throat> library, the library director who's here today emailed me and said that your criteria includes the appropriateness of subject matter. Uh, so that does uh, mean that influences, social influences are in play when you choose books. Uh, lastly, you say that uh, Meyer and McCray say that they're committed to keeping obscenity out of the library. Well, there's over 330 books right now that are have sexually explicit content that are in the minor sections. And I'm not going to get to a legal debate about the definition of obscenity or pornography, because that's what you like to do. Uh, the fact of the matter is, I'm a one issue voter. OK, six words. Explicit books out of minor sections. Very simple, unassailable. Uh, you've got books. 330, I could go on forever, but my time is coming up, so that's enough for me today. I am going to vote for Tim Plass and Tom Hanley on May 16th. Thank you. <clears throat> Kara Claridge. So I see on your agenda today that you have two minutes allotted to discuss legislative updates. So I wanted to speak some on that topic. As you know, the Children's School and Library Protection Act was drafted and championed by Idaho Family Policy Center this legislative session <clears throat> to address the growing concerns about sexually explicit materials at public schools and community libraries that children are allowed to access. In fact, recent statewide polling showed 75% of voters wanted libraries to keep pornographic material away from minor children. Hours of testimony was given by concerned citizens across the state, and all of the legislators that represent Kootenai County were strongly supportive of this legislation. In fact, at the end of this session, a supermajority of the Senate and nearly two thirds of the House voted for this bill. So based on this, I think that maybe you're the extremists pushing a social, political, and a bulk religious agenda, not us. I've been following the decisions of this board for at least 18 months and have felt my concerns about protecting children have been routinely ignored. It seems that you have used the diversity, equity, and inclusion mantra as a shield in order to allow all kinds of highly inappropriate things in. And we're not fooled. <laughs> and now in a stunning show of deception, you're certain of your re-election campaign say that you're the protectors of children? I'm not really here to accuse you. In fact, I forgive you. I'm not sure the rest of the community will, though, because real children are being harmed by your choices. Sadly, you seem to be more willing to listen to a group of people who have been heavily lied to, 
are very confused and on a path of mental illness. There's no constitutional reason that libraries cannot take reasonable steps to prevent children from accessing harmful materials. And you have not shown a willingness to do that. The children's library card appears to be nothing more than an election talking point. And even if eventually implemented has so many loopholes, most likely nothing of real significance will be done. Hundreds of books still adorn your bookshelves that do nothing but pollute innocent minds. There remains a clarion call by this community to clean up the shelves, remove the pornography, and reach for a higher calling in this present moment. We don't want the continued influence of globalism. We don't want lies. We don't want deception. We want truth to prevail at the end of the day. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, Jeff Lewis. Jeff Lewis, Post Falls. Children are banned from many activities that are now age appropriate by regulations and laws of public agencies and companies. Children under 18 are banned from buying cigarettes and alcohol. Children under 18 are banned from military service. Children under 18 are banned from attending a sexually explicit NC-17 movie by the Motion Picture Association. Children under 18 are banned from buying marijuana. Children under 18 are banned from getting a tattoo in most states. Children under 18 are banned from purchasing a gun. Children under 18 are banned from renting a car or a hotel room. Children under 18 are banned from legalized betting, casinos, and lottery tickets. Children under 18 are banned from voting. Children under 18 are banned by banks from getting a credit card. Why are they banned from these activities? We all know the answer. It's because they're not mentally or emotionally ready as children. These are activities that when they turn 18, they can participate in. This is a uh, excerpt from one of your books that's in the Priest Lake Library. If you want to look it up right now, the young adult bio section. It's called All Boys Are Not Blue by George M. Johnson. And uh, on the uh, links, it says 2021 teens top 10 nominee, currently available in the Priest Lake Library. It has graphic descriptions of anal and oral sex between men. This is a quote from page 266 right here. I knew what I had to do, even though I had never done it before. I had one point of reference, and that was seven years of watching pornography. Although the porn was heterosexual, it was enough of a reference to get the job done. Pornography is a cancer on developing young minds and like cigarettes, marijuana, and alcohol, if left alone, this cancer will cause lifelong addictions and destroy healthy relationships. This book should be banned from children under the age of 18 in our libraries. These books are not age appropriate for our children. We need to protect them from doing physical and emotional lifelong harm to themselves and the consequences of their childish sometimes bad decisions. Book publishers such as Simon & Schuster's, the American Library Association, and the Community Library Network should ban pornographic and sexually explicit books in the children's section under 18 of our libraries and schools. I will be voting for Tom Hanley and Tim Plass on May 16th with the rest of my family and my friends to restore healthy libraries <laughs> for our children. Thank you. Um, Skip, and I can't read the last name. It starts with a J. Hi. Skip Giroux here. I'm from Apple, and I've been using this library for seven years. And it's the nicest damn library in the whole country. The Community Library Network here in Treatment County is the best thing we have going on. And if you vote for these two guys that have their explicit agenda to destroy the Community Library Network, we're going to end up looking like NIC, and the clown show will keep on running. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we've come to the end of the list that I've been handed. Um, so we are ready now to and thank you all for speaking, and we are all ready. We're ready now to move on to the regular part of our agenda. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. All right. So the next thing that we have on the agenda is Jill's Apple annual Apple report. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jill. I'm the manager here at Apple Library. I've been here for about six years, and I was at Post Falls Library before that. And my background education is in landscape, architecture, and design, and horticulture. And this is what I choose to do because it's the best job I ever had. And our members are, are very important to us in the library, and it's just a good atmosphere. So um, I'm going to fly through my presentation because I have a lot on there, and I see that I'm given 15 minutes. You, you can take whatever you need. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> okay. So thank you all for coming today. And this is um, from 2022 to 2023, mostly from March of 2022 to March, this or last month of 2023. Okay, so this board presentation consists of a lot of photos and pictures of fun events and contests, activities, member happenings, etc. And most of these activities um, are often the best parts of our weeks, but there are many day to day um, duties that we have here and we have learned going through some of the hardships with COVID and then the political climate up here. We've as a team here, we've really learned to work together, to respect each other, to help each other, and we've come a long ways, and we've become more efficient, and we've become friends here. And we love our members a lot. I mean, this is like a community center here. When people walk in, we say, hi, Pat, hi, Richard, you know, so it's a, it's like a family environment here, and we love our members. We love our work. Um, the Athol Library Golden Book Award has been going on for about, um, oh, probably five years. And every month or every other month, one of our um, librarians received the Library Golden Library Book Award. And I choose, and I've never received it. They haven't given it to me at this point. But um, so I... You know, and everybody ends up getting that because, as I said, we're a team and we really work well together and uh, help each other. So everyone does receive it. And um, here's the staff here. This is Bethany here on the far left. Um, she's our kids librarian. And she has been here for about four years and is awesome. I mean, her programs are fun and funny and active and our stats have gone up since she's been on board. She does an excellent job. Janet here it has been here for much longer than I have, <laughs> double the time that I've been here and she is really dedicated and she's a worker and she's a CERC specialist and just is on top of things. She should receive that, could receive that. Uh, Golden Book Award every month, mm -hmm. as as others of us do. Can Crystal is a search specialist. She's been here for quite a while. She is great at customer service and seeing where um, work needs to can be done. And is always busy. Gwen has been here um, quite long, to uh, three or four years, and she is dedicated and a real good worker. And Grace has been here just over a year, and she's our adult programmer and a search specialist, and she's just jumped right into that role as adult programmer. She does an amazing job and always coming up with good ideas. Uh, we have two volunteers, Bella and Marilyn. They've been here for, well, Bella's been here for probably 18 years, and she comes every Thursday. And she cleans, and she cleans like no one else. Um, she has a hair remover that she removes hair on the 
see she dusts the corners, but she's awesome. And she has a little tote she takes around, but she faithfully comes here every Thursday and we love her. She's part of our team. Marilyn has been here about four years and her, she moved up here with her family and was looking for something to do and dropped in. And we said, yes, come on in. And she comes here every Monday and dusts and gets corners and um, arranges books or put books back in order when she sees that they're out of order. And she's a gem too. So we really appreciate the extra work that they do for us here. Um, here's our statistics. And as I said, from March of 2022 to March of 2023, and total circulation in our library has gone up 13%. The item number of items circulated has gone up 5%. Computer use, internet use has gone down 10%. And I'm not real surprised by that because when we first started here and first had um, public computers, many people didn't have their own devices or their own computers at home or Wi-Fi. So um, a lot more people have those at this time and the need to come in here and use ours isn't as great, great as it was, um, but we still get a lot of use or internet and computer. And then our new patrons has gone up 28%. And we feel that as all of us that live here, our, our North Idaho has really grown and become really popular or destination for people. So um, we're so happy they've been coming to the library. And it's like every week we get new applications for um, library cards and families and that's great. And then our number of people that have come into the library is up 24%. So we have been super busy. Um, so we have a strategic plan in place. It's on the Community Library Network website. And we uh, set our goals based on the goals and strategies of the strategic plan. That's a, a guide we use as we're you know, working in our library and moving forward. So the goals and strategies, um, one of them is to increase awareness and engagement with community library programs and services and expand communication throughout the service area. And we recently joined the Bayview Chamber of Commerce and they are active, real, um, into things group. They have a lot going on. Their meetings are at the Bayview Community Center and they just are an active community. And it's nice to be able to interact with them and get to know them better. And, and I spoke at their meeting and told them all about our library. So um, they are more aware of us too. And um, Deliver unique and responsive programs driven by community needs and interests. Expand programs for adults and seniors, um, which we've been doing for well ever, um, and we continue to do more of that because adults and seniors are a group that, you know, um, or there are a lot of us out there, and to have programs and um, events to come to that cater to our age group is it's really important and we found that it's you know it's really caught on since grace got on board um, a year ago I, as i said she's just been going for it but our um, in-house programs have gone up 129 percent and our attendance has gone up 45 percent so we are so happy that we've been able to engage seniors and adults. Um, some of our adult programs, um, we have a library member, Cheryl Luger, that's been here as a member forever. And she offered to do some candy making classes because she, every holiday she brings us candy and we're saying, you got to tell us how to make these. So she came and taught two classes. And then um, Crystal's nephew, Kyle, he used to cook for uh, a business and he's a professional and he's done it on video, YouTube. So he 
came and did um, soup recipes, soup um, cooking, showed people how to cook soups. And he became so popular that we ended up having to move him to the community center because our room wasn't big enough. But he was very and an excellent cook and an excellent presenter. He's very impressive. We all we have a lot of gardeners and people that um, like to grow their own food around in our area. And um, so Sue Balkerman is a Post Falls resident and she goes around to all the libraries every year and presents programs on gardening, pruning, roses, growing herbs. Um, this year, she's going to talk about pollinators, planting plants for pollinators. So she's she's very popular. And then last year, we had Bonsai Bob come and show us all how to do bonsai. And this is Bella. She um, was pleased to get the bonsai that was made that day, take it and give it up. Okay, more adult programs. Um, so here, these. Uh, Musicians are sitting right here, and the acoustics in this library are awesome, mm -hmm. and it sounds beautiful in here. So every year we get good turnout for our music programs. Um, Sean plays African poor harp. Larry Almeida plays classic guitar and sings. And um, Peter Fletcher came all the way from New York City this last uh, spring or last fall, and wowed us all with his classical guitar. And paint and sip. Um, this became so popular that mm -hmm. it's over at the community center as well for adults. And Grace just finds it's a paint and sip program on, on YouTube and she shows it on the big screen and then explains and passes around the paint stuff, and that has been wonderful for adults here. They've really gotten me into it. And here's a big uh, Chef Kyle Cooks over at the community center when he had 16 people come to a uh, soup program. Okay, and so um, long our strategic plan, strategic plan, develop more programs for families to learn and discover together and with other families. And this has always been a focus of the Community Library Network and the Athel Library. And we always partake in Athel Days. The bookmobile comes up, the Discovery Bus comes up, and um, that's just a great way to interact with our community and ed educate our members and the community about our library and all that we offer. Um, we had a country dance party as part of our families and um, families programs. Uh, Sandy Weiss is a, she lives in Spokane Valley, but she teaches uh, line dancing. And we had 65 people show up across the parking lot at, on the basketball court and um, danced and had hot dogs and sodas and everything like that. And this is Bethany and her sons, Saul or uh, Jimmy and Michael, and they helped their big home. So that was so fun and people loved it and has to do it again and again. So um, drawing teens in here is a challenge. We, there's the high school's not near here. Uh, they don't walk by here. They're not in this area and they don't really get the chance to come in. So we're always trying to come up with ways to attract teens. And Bethany did the paint and sip for teens. And yeah, we got several of them and we were very happy about that. And they had a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. That was fun. And then summer reading kickoff party, the theme was um, a day in the pirate's life for me. And there's Bethany and Janet, they get all into it and dress up <laughs> and go for it. And and then the members came with their kids all dressed up and that, it was a lot of fun. And 
more kids programs. Um, we had the, this is an, considered an event, an outside individual. His, he does Red Yarn Theater. Um, he came and sang and played his banjo out there on the grass. And then Bethany does story times every Wednesday morning here. And she's been packing them in like uh, 40, 45 people coming in here. And it gets pretty nuts. But so far. Uh, here, everybody came in their Halloween garb, which was a lot of fun. I keep saying fun. <laughs> it's fun <laughs> here. <laughs> um, and then we um, engage strategic partners to leverage shared expertise and enhance community services. And we've done this with Super One and other uh, families and businesses in the community where we um, have the community library network sprinter van and um, we have candy and books and Bethany and Bethany's husband Saul and Janet were at this one super one parking lot run for treat and that one we we've done it for four years and this last year we took more than ever candy and books and still didn't have it up. It just keeps growing and getting what does more company, than What does Trump mean? Um, so people wind their cars up or their vehicles, trucks, golf carts, and then they have candy in the back and in the parking lot, all the families walk down the line of vehicles and get treats from their So the pickup truck is probably the most popular one with the trunk full. <laughs> yeah. Although the community library sprinter van is um, well, just as pretty big too. So yeah, that one's a good one. Um, so we have had an all ages cookie contest. The cookies were amazing. And Jan Jean, Jenny, and uh, Emily were the, some of the winter, Emily got it. Uh, special mention, but um, that was fun. And we had a lot of participation in that. And then we have all ages coloring contest, kids and adults, and a lot of people um, chose to participate in that. Um, Karen, the YS, um, supervisor gave help me with these kids statistics for kids programs and this is the statistics for in-house program attendance and this is for the first for 12 months of 2022 and then six months of 2023 we, we can't i couldn't compare 2021 with what you know how we're at now that just would be distorted but um so what this shows is that we are on track to surpass attendance for the baby toddler and preschool programs um by the end of our spring session so in 2022 12 months we had 913 people attend and already in six months we have 828 we've really seen an increase in kids and this too is the outreach program attendance and that's a little more challenging um uh like bethany goes to sunrise daycare and um to farragut park we have a, a partnership with farragut and but again with our outreach we are currently on track to su um, surpass the attendance for babies toddlers and um, preschool in our kids outreach programs too so we're doing good there and this is number of kids programs offered in-house this is the total number and we are on track again to um, surpass for 2023 the number of kids programs we have here um kids it's slower to catch up that age um, for some reason. And I mentioned teens are challenging to get in here. We continue to work on that. 
And then other would be like if schools came here and or any uh, program or a group from a different town or something came to our library to see what's going on here. We work on those uh, programs all the time for try to as well. So um, increase awareness and engagement with community library network programs and services. And I mentioned the outreach um, with Sunrise and they, Bethany, Sunrise Daycare is just right over there and Bethany will go there and do a story time. And um, then they will, in the summer, they'll walk up here and this day they all walked up by here in their pink t-shirts and we had a story time outside. And this is our one of our programs we had with our Farragut, at Farragut State Park partnership. Ranger Liz came up and talked about animal skins, and we often have programs there at Farragut too. And Liz has been a ranger there just for a couple of years, and she has really been on board to be a partner. And so that's great having another place where Bethany can do programs and they're outdoors and their hikes and they're like nighttime stargazing. We had one for teens and that one was popular for teens. So we'll do that again. Um, so we had, I don't know who uh, applied for the Project Neighborly Grant, but somebody did. I think it was Amy. 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 Amy was our director before, and we we received that, and all of our libraries got monies to do a program event that would be engaging in the community. And we brought Sandy, the line dance line dance dancer um, teacher, um, back, and we had a masquerade ball over at the community center, and the week before we had a table set up where families could come in and make their own masquerade mask mm -hmm. and then um, everybody showed up and we did line dancing and swing dancing and had hot dogs and food and stuff mm -hmm. so that was fun. once again fun <laughs> okay and engage strategic partners to leverage shared ex expertise and enhance community service this is jacob he's a 18 year old he was we were asked by the department of labor to give him some hours to work here so that he could gain work experience so that when he went out into the um, world to work he would have some skills so he comes here and he comes at hayden and he's a character he's he's funny but in a like a uh just yeah, it's not obvious, but it takes, he's been wonderful. And we feel like we've been giving him a lot of chances to do things and choose what he'd like to work on. And he's been helpful. And I think he likes it. We have a meeting room that our public is welcome to use. And we do get consistent um, groups that use it. Our 4-H group meets here every um, Monday, and that here they're learning about the parts of the pig. And then we have a Bayview Book Club that has met here forever on the third Wednesdays of every month. And it's nice to have that uh, meeting room that we can lend out to people. Okay, miscellaneous miscellaneous accomplishments. Um, we keep getting more and more stuff and. Stuff bothers me. <laughs> um, Randy, Lindsay, and Karen came up and looked around, and we ended up with new shelving in our storage room back there. So that, I mean, that storage room, you had to take everything out to get in it. So we now have shelves up there. And um, Brian, who's our facilities guy um he built this new cabinet back there in the meeting room and put the shelves in it and all of those kids boxes and toys and baskets and supplies and all that go into there 
And then um, right up here at the front desk, we got more shelving because of the library of things has become really popular and we get more and more of those. And so now we have storage on this side and more here to store all those things. So thank you, Randy and Lindsay mm -hmm. and Brian. Almost done. So um, we requested uh, grants from the friends, friends of the library and from the library foundation. And we got those where we got a coffee table, that one right back there. And um, also these comfy chairs with USB ports. And those are, <laughs> they, those are filled full all the time. So you have to come early. If and our goals for next year are, and these goals just continue year after year, to reach out to Ethel businesses and the Bayview community and talk more about our library and what we offer, just to get the word out more. And continue to recommend books and authors for our members. That's one thing about this staff here. They're excellent at Reader's Advisor. Good. Continue to provide exceptional service and continue to proudly and confidently do our work. And so um, we're lucky that we get support from our sister libraries, uh, for our, from our admin team, from the board and the friends and the foundation and from our members. February was National Love your library month and we had this sign out here and people wrote why they loved us and I really like this. The libraries are kind and always cheerful. Librarians are kind and always cheerful and helpful and the books are wonderful from one of our fans, Valerie. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. So. All right. Do we have questions or comments? Yes, I have a question about the Library of Things. Sure. If you had a chainsaw, would you check that out to an 11 year old? Why not? Because we don't check out to kids. Um, the parent could come check it out. And then the parent would say, you can't use that. <laughs> the Library of Things is 418 and up. It, a child could not check out Library of Things, and you have to have an agreement in place to check them out. Anything else? I have a, I have a question. Well, first statement, it's always good to see you. And it, it, it's so evident how much you love being here, or else you put on a good show. <laughs> no, it's, it's always good to see you. Uh, I have a question about the Department of Labor. Well, is it a volunteer or an employee? Volunteer? Um, the Department Jacob. of Labor pays um, Jacob. Okay, and so is that a normal situation, or can you tell us a little bit about why that's, a, you know, how they contacted you? Why did he want to be a, a library worker, or what exactly that's about? So um, they contacted Karen. Um, our YS services uh, administrator and ask if we had any anything in place where um, an individual could come and learn some work skills. And Karen contacted us because Jacob lives up north here and um, his caseworker, he's got a caseworker there at the Department of Labor named Casey and Casey met with me and went over the program. And so I have a timesheet that Jacob fills out every time he's here. And then I submit that every two weeks to the Department of Labor and Jacob gets a wage. Okay. And I don't know the origination of that program or, or anything really more than that, except that, oh, and then Jacob did say when one of the first times he was here, um, I was talking to him about the library and what we do and what kind of experiences he may get here. And he said he 
had been thinking about working in a library and he was happy that he got the opportunity to be in it and see how things go. And Bethany has a lot of um, things that she has him do um, to get ready for kids programs. And we have, oh, it's not, it's like when we had all our Christmas decorations up, he came in and I'm like, well, how about helping me take down the Christmas decorations? And so that's what we did do. And, but he's, when he's here, he sees all that goes on and he'll dust a shelf once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. Can I follow up on that a minute? Is that program something that other libraries should be looking at? How do we um, learn more? Well, so we were contacted and I contacted Spirit Lake Library uh -huh. and Rathdrum Library. Good. It says we have this and said we have this individual who needs to get work experience yeah. and we're having him on board and they didn't they didn't have anything. I ought to be honest, it's challenging to come up with things for That's people cool. to do because we can't let them do um like book shelving. We can't let them do the the tasks that we do and get paid for. It has to be you know like Bella cleaning and um Jacob sorting. The steam kits, he's really good at, you know, they get returned and are missing parts and he goes through them and checks to see if everything is in the kit that is on the list. So, but yeah, uh, Rathrum did not have a need for him, um, nor did Spirit Lake, but um, Hayden had, and the youth services is um, finding a lot for him to do there at Hayden. And he's inconsistent um he's yeah he's got some family things going on but he's you know he's fun and funny and a good kid and it's nice to be helping him and i think he is getting experience uh i just was gonna check it it sounds like a great program and i'm all for it we always need to balance does it take more of your time to manage him then he can provide spirit service to back to the library? Sometimes, yeah. Like when Bethany's here, um, she, you know, her schedule's in, you know, she's here doing a program, she's over there, she, anyway, so he arrives at certain days. And if she's not here, I struggle to find things for him to do. Um, but we, we do sometimes. Well, Bethany too has been noting <laughs> projects on the whiteboard back in the meeting room for him to do. So when he does come, there's a list of things for him to do, and that has helped a lot. Uh, it sounds like you're learning how to work with him, yes. with his skills, and he's learning how to work with us. Yes. As I think that through, I think that's an appropriate role for libraries that come out in community service in different ways because. Either the public pays for his care in other ways, or we help through wages here. Yeah. And I, I commend you for that. I know one time we worked with Tesh, with another organization here in town. We experimented with that at one place it worked out fine, another place it didn't. And I think we need to have that kind of independent decision making by you. Uh, yeah. Uh, branch it's, managers. It's, I, I appreciate the efforts that you're making. Thank you. Yeah. He's a good kid. And it's like I said, I. I like going home knowing that he's had uh, uh, maybe an unusual experience here, <laughs> but it's usually it's good you know, when I think he's learning out a lot here. I don't have any questions. I just want to thank you for your report and great work up here in Apple. Thank you, Regina. I still have one other question. Oh, uh, I'm delighted in all the growth that you were describing is happening, and it's reflected in our our branch and the numbers you were showing us are very helpful. What is the population of Athol at, at this time? I know it's growing, but anybody have a sense of what size community we're serving? Maybe some of the people that live here. True population of Athol. Anyone know? Okay, we know I don't think here. That's what I was It's growing. It is growing. Yeah. I don't. I live in Post Falls, so. Well, thank you for making the journey out here in the winter. We like to come in the summer rather than winter to come yeah. visit you because it's it's uh, more fun and we get to both see the inside of the facility and get the programs. I'm just uh, 
excited because over the years, uh, our board has always had a philosophy. We don't take over branches, but when communities come to us and say, um, we'd like you as professional operators in a library to take over to operate our library, we are happy to do that. And it's only when the local community agrees to that, that was before your time, I do believe, mm -hmm. that uh, we found that that alcohol, I think we were across in the community room with the library downstairs mm -hmm. in a dark and dank place. And, and it's been a joy to see get this built. And it's a combination of the community helping us do that. And then to see it grow is just what certainly I think library boys to be championing. We think it up and then you all get to go do it. So thank you for doing it. You're welcome. Pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Wait a second. I have one thing. Oh, okay. I think that you should protest for never having received the Golden Book Award. That's not fair. That's right. <laughs> you should threaten. Yeah, I, I, I'm tempted for sure. Like, yeah. I don't know how to say it. I'm calling a meeting. Now, when am I going to get a, yeah. a Golden Book don't Award? Be so. Yeah, I would say don't be so. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, we could do that. I, uh, then I think they should just do it because I deserve it, not because I asked them to do it. But anyway, yeah. thank you, Kate. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Joan. Yeah. That was wonderful. All right. Um, so the next item on our agenda is the consent agenda. And I was asking Lindsay beforehand, I didn't see minutes of the CIN meeting, so we'll probably, if they have them next time. Yeah. Which, which one? Uh, in the consent agenda, right. minutes of the CIN meeting were not included. So CIN, yeah, yeah, okay, good. So that's uh, that will that will be included next time. So this consent agenda will include everything except the minutes of the CIN meeting. And Madam Chair, I had a question about the consent agenda. Then. Yes, because we'll need to an emotion accept it. And I can't find it in here, but I remember reading and wondering about uh, your request, uh, Rochelle, for the books that she was concerned about. I remember that right. That there was a request in one of our notes about would you give us that list? Do you remember that? Um, yeah, I remember being in the past. Um, we had someone so right. like, that made that request. Oh, so where are we with that that request? We're, we're waiting to hear from you. No. Oh, where did it go? I uh, never. Maybe that's my question. Yeah. Well, maybe. Not, you guys have had it. I guess you guys have been on the Green Books Reference website, right? I don't think it's on. No, we want. Can to you know. send it to me? Oh no, um, all of it. we can look it up. So the request was. I find the quote, but was it anybody else remember seeing it? I didn't make it up, did I? The request was somewhere for, in these minutes that I remember reading it that Rochelle had some comments, and you asked her then to give us a list of those books so we too could learn. And this, my question was, did that happen? Sounds like it didn't. Maybe I need to find the. Is this a list that's different from the list that you were just referring to? Like, Rochelle, like, are you asking Judy for a, a list that? I'm asking Rochelle for the list I heard her reference. And I heard Katie say, could you give us the list of books you're concerned about? Okay. But I, I'm happy to look and see where I can. And so it. I was never directed. Did you send, did I, did you, did I miss an email that you sent us to go look someplace else? Um, yeah, we're listening. We're needing okay, so me. that what you're saying is, if I wanted to know the books you were concerned about, I should look in this. Well, there's so many lists. That's my question. Um, well, I think you were asking for the list, and I think that you can look that up as well as I can. I didn't. I don't know where to look. Oh, well, I don't. I thought that you guys had the materials from Clean Books for Kids. Is that the list yeah. that you're referring to? Because that's what I wasn't sure about. Because there's so many different lists as you go online. Yeah, you I'm identified. Sure. Uh, blank would like the list of materials that Audison Fields are seen for ages 0 to 12 on page 2 of Post Falls Special Meeting Thursday, the 23rd of March. Just, I didn't I do remember it. That's, that's what I was going for. There was also discussion about um, children's books that um, included masturbation references that I am not certain what you were talking about that I was wondering about too. Because um, there's, the so I think there's multiple things that have been right. referenced right. that none of us have clear guidance on what are actually being talked about. Okay, because you said that you knew the title. 
Uh, right. The title that I'm familiar with is like our bodies are cool and there is no masturbation in that book. So there could be another book that I'm not familiar with. And let me read this in, out of context. It was page two where it says uh, Robinson moved to accept the consent. Robinson asked why Garcia asked what the problem, concerns the public were. This is concerned about all addressed in the policy. Flight noted materials of children's collection geared for 0 through 12 are not pornographic. The book Addison reference has not received a reconsideration request. Barrington, this is our attorney, stated that material that is obscene or is considered harmful to minors, as defined by the legislature, should not be in a section of the library for minors. What is obscene and what is harmful to minors must meet certain tests as outlined in law. Personal opinion of what is obscene or considered harmful to minors may cross the line into viewpoint discrimination. Work ongoing struggling to figure out what that is. And then follows blank would like the list of materials that Addison feels are obscene for ages 0 to 12. So when I saw that, I thought, let's see, I'd like to learn what that is. And I guess we're coming back to you, Rochelle, on, on can that happen? Did it happen? Did I miss it? Well, the, the list has uh, lots of books that parents might be concerned about, not just the sexually explicit materials. Um, and the list is, is? It's on clean books for kids. Okay, so that's the list you're referring to? My concern at that was that the statement keeps being made that we have um, pornographic and obscene materials in the children's department. Right. When we reference the children's department, we're talking about ages zero to 12. Right. And that was what I wanted to know specifically, which specific books are you referring to? That's what I wanted to know. And I think we all should have the board if this is a concern. Right, if there are specific, you know, and I, you know, we understand the difficulties. I think all the whole board understands the difficulties in young adult. What I'm looking at is I I was kind of trying to limit that and say children's department means zero to 11, right? Well, zero, zero, zero to 12. Mm -hmm. And um, I what I wanted to know were the specific books that were seen as pornographic or obscene in that department. And I don't have, I mean, to, you know, so to go through this giant list where there's a, other things, what I really would like to see is very specifically a book that's pornographic or obscene from the children's department. That's what I wanted to know. Then we can and, and I'm assuming that the list has got hundreds of books as people keep referring to. So, that's what I'm I'm asking is which ones are specifically pornographic and obscene from the children's department. And I am not certain how you get that. OK, um, well, the first thing is that when most people say children's sections, they mean everyone under 18. Yeah, um, but that's so, not what I asked. Right. For. OK, so two books um, that were in the 0 to 11 section are changing you. Uh, which first I had just seen a page in there uh, that said basically until you're old enough to have sex with other people, um, you know, go ahead and explore your own body, masturbate. Um, I don't it's called it's, Changing You. Uh, changing You. Do you have the author? Um, Gail Saltz. S-A-L-T-Z. Um, so when I read the book, uh, other than just that that one page that I was first exposed to, uh, the rest of the book seemed even worse. It wasn't just the one page. Uh, the other book is The Big Bathhouse yeah. by Yo, that's K-Y-O, McClear. Um, okay. So what's the last name? The Big Bathhouse. The last name. And the last name is McClear, M-A-C-L-E-A-R. Um, and that's uh, I actually haven't looked through the whole book. I, I did look through the part of it, and it just was a lot of full frontal nudity. Do we like, own that book? Yes. We own the book? You can look it up on the lawn, can we? Yeah, I can look. I'm not. In what grade, what level is it? Can you look it up? Um, anyway, it just was full frontal nudity. It seemed like it was designed to get children used to seeing naked adults just walking around with no clothing, um, and that's not acceptable. It's acceptable for some people. 
in some cultures, in some areas. I'm, well, I'm just saying it's not, I just wanted to say that not everybody finds that unacceptable. Um, okay, well, that's true, but here in our community, it should be our community standards, and it seems to me that it is grooming children to be used to children or adults walking around with their private parts hanging out for the kids to view. And that is unacceptable for some people. A and large other... majority of the kids. Can we, um, I have a couple of comments, but can we just exhaust this list? Rochelle, I think this is very important. And what I would chime in is to say that, um, and I have had this conversation separately with the board's attorney, when you are stating at a public meeting that we have obscenity in the children's section, our, I believe our board attorney has made a separate request to you that you tell us what these books are. So that is current. that's the conversation we're currently having. Um, if those representations are being made, they need to be factual and need to tell us what the books are. So, so far on my list, and I also would like to know if you did receive a letter from or an email from the board's attorney asking you for the titles and whether you responded to that email. But as of right now, I have written down Changing You by Gail Saltz and The Big Bathhouse by McClear, I think you said. The B A T H bath? Yes, I guess that I didn't. I'm sorry, I didn't realize that, that was a demand. I just thought it was like she wanted to know. She she doesn't just want to know, she needs to know. You have made a representation in a public meeting. Are there, do you have a factual, is there a factual underpinning for those statements? Our board attorney would like to know. Okay, well, I gave an example of two that are in the little kids section, and uh, we've had I think it's numerous, it. numerous people come in here and read stuff that's in the older children's section, um, also you guys call uh, young adult, but they are minors, and there's a lot of them. So their parents don't go. And Lindsay, can we be clear, because I am so confused <laughs> on, I know that some books have been moved. To different sections, mm -hmm. not moved from the library or right. out of library. Um, is this because of reconsideration, or is this because of uh, librarians reviewing them on their own? And I, I know we keep talking about a list, and we need a list, mm -hmm. but we also need to know which books on the list have been addressed because some have, and and how does how do more get addressed? Is it by the reconsideration or is it by librarians taking it upon themselves or is it both because i think if i'm confused on this public must be confused on this and i am fully prepared to discuss and talk about that that was going to be part of the director's report but if you want i can jump to that we right can wait now. i can wait anyway okay because i do have some okay. answers for That's you perfect. That's helpful. Thank you. one of, if i just to clarify Regina, the reason that Katie Brereton was asking specifically, because as our attorney, if that is so, she needs to advise us that we're we, we, we have a legal problem. Is that correct? Yes. Right. That is correct. That is the purpose of the email you received. So, yeah, she's like, OK, tell me so that I um, I can advise the library appropriately. Um, all right. So, we, Madam Chair, I was I asked about that question. Do we have resolution to it at this point? What's going to happen? Yeah, let's 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 move forward with. We are on the consent agenda. Let's stay there and right. you know so the, get this done and then move on to the next item. Right. But I wasn't sure what happened with this this topic. Then we have directions for BD to do something. We were waiting to hear from our attorney. We have two. No, we can't. Our attorney can't advise us until she gets a response. OK, so that's where we are with this list. Thank you. And so I would just ask my fellow board member to please respond to the inquiry that you have received from the board's attorney. Um, okay. While we're on that page, page two of the minutes from March 23rd, I did have a couple of changes. I saw some minor typos. I'm not even going to mess with those. I'm just <laughs> going to focus on on this particular page on my motion, I believe my uh, at the top of the page on page two under succession planning, 
The motion was um, McCree moved to authorize the district's attorney to draft a contract. It says to be given to the chosen candidate. My recollection is I said to be presented. It wasn't, you know, the idea was, you know, please draft us a contract that could be presented. Um, so could we change the word given to presented? Is everyone okay with that? Mm -hmm. And then um, the part that Judy read at the bottom of the page, mm -hmm. and I also wasn't here for that for that discussion um, where these um, books, um, obscene books for ages zero to 12. I wasn't here to the discussion where that was talked about, so I, I absolutely am interested in said list. But um, where it says Robinson moved to accept, it should say the consent agenda. Mm -hmm. If we could add the word agenda. Thank you. Those, those are the two changes that I wanted to have made. And with that, I'll move just for purposes of mm -hmm. trying to push us along that we approve the consent agenda without the CIN February minutes. But with changes noted? With, right. I move to, I move <laughs> that we accept the consent agenda with changes noted with the exception of the CIN minutes. Okay, it's been moved to accept the consent agenda without the CIN minutes, but with changes noted. Um, any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda are our financial statements, and we have both February and March. And the first thing I would like to do is does staff have anything you'd like to note to us? Silence. <laughs> <laughs> And have we always had the words unaudited at the top left? Read. <laughs> that was added as this goes on part of the board packet on our website. Oh, okay. And okay. so it is documentation that they're not fully audited. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Good, good, good. And I'm sure I'd sure like to commend the staff again for giving me the script ahead of time with the revenue and expenditures mm -hmm. description. I have to refer to it more often than I would like to admit to, but it's very helpful to have. Never ask the treasurer for comments. I I mean, there's nothing outstanding in either month that I feel we need to, you know, discuss unless you all have specific questions about expenditures. No, no, go ahead. All revenue. Um, the I a couple things that rose to, to my attention were that uh, with Once February March in. February, and I think it's referenced in the March one too about our storage rental rates that yes. they went up, and so you 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 changed and to save the district money. So that excellent there. Um, the line of regarding um, associations. Let me see where I <laughs> start at dues for the month of March of 2023. It's indicating that there was membership. Paid for four staff. I believe. I assume that's ALA memberships for four staff. Is that what that is referencing? Yes, uh, we are sending four staff to the ALA conference, and in order to get a discounted rate, we pay for one year of membership. But my question is, and I just want to know if my understanding is accurate, because I have seen uh, information out there in the in the public that. The Community Library Network is a member of the American Library Association, and that is inaccurate, correct? That is correct. ALA um, is, you cannot have membership as an institution. You have membership as an individual. And the library in and of itself is not a member of ALA. And I don't know, and this would not be fair to ask you off the top of your head, Lindsay, but I mean, this is an individual choice of of our staff members as to whether or not they choose to join a professional organization. Yes, um, individuals have, they make their own decision if they wish to join. When um, we do try to pay for the membership when they go to conferences because it is a savings for us. Um, I know that as the assistant director and the director, it's, I think, an essential thing that we have memberships for their administrative staff so they can be clued into what's going on across the country. But other staff, they can choose what they want to do. 
Meaning if you didn't have a subscription, would you not say get like their newsletter or something? Right. They have a um, monthly publication. They have various um, special topic or interest groups and round tables and um, daily news letters that you can see what's happening in the libraries across the country. Got it. Could I follow up on that? So that would also include national legislation? That's correct, yes. Idaho legislation. Mm -hmm. Okay, where do we get our information about Idaho legislation? From, um, from the Idaho Library Association. Thank you. I have another question and it fell on my head. More questions concerning, more comments or concerns or anything about the financial statements? Any? Want to, want to make a motion? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I, I move that we accept the Community Library Network for the of March 2023 financial statements. Okay, it's to move to accept the <clears throat> Community Library Network um, February and March financial statements. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. And opposed. All right. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, my thought came back, which was to identify the meeting in June, is one that's to honor one of our librarians. That's correct. It's the annual American Library Association Conference, and one of our librarians will be recognized nationally for the work that she's done with teens in our community library network. Yes. And I, I personally, I'm sure I'm behalf of the board too, today. Please relay our congratulations to her. It's a lot of hard work, and she's the only one being recognized, right? For that, that this category. Yes, for that category, that award, it is a unique award, and it truly is a once in a lifetime event. And I personally am so proud of her. Uh -huh. Like, it's just, it, it's wonderful. Like, it's really an honor. I think on behalf of the board, please relay our congratulations as well. Okay. Um, and then we go on to the Community Library Network up reports. Um, comments that people would like to make about them? Um, I, I had a lot of comments, but I'm just gonna distill it because we don't have time. And we also have two months worth of board reports to go through. Um, one of the things, I would point out from the April report at the end from our youth services coordinator um, regarding the implementation plan of the library card for minors policy. The library card for minors policy is in place. We obviously have some work to do as far as implementation. Um, I appreciated that our youth services coordinator indicated that there will be consistency in the process of going through the catalog. And um, I think there are probably more conversations that are going to be happening about that. But anyway. Uh. And I can, you know, that the implementation is not on the agenda, but um, there is a team that is has this as their primary task. We've had one big meeting we are going to have another one later this month or later this week and we have sub teams that are working behind the scenes um what i it is saddening to me that um we implemented this policy and we clearly said it would not start until july 1st but yet we are being thrown under the bus as if it's not happening yet. So that's discouraging, but it just lets me know that we need to provide more education to the public about this. And we don't want to rush or act with haste. We want to make sure we are being fair and equitable and that we're looking at all of the things that need to be done to put this policy in place. So we are working um, and it's, going to get done it's just you know it takes time right and that was exactly kind of what i wanted to touch upon because um i think it is paramount as the system is undertaking implementing the plan 
that we have clearly formulated objective criteria that are being used yes. that are unassailable. And timeline. So there's no possible way to rush that. And I, and I, this board member does not want it to be rushed because it needs to be methodical and it needs to be, um, and I'm going to talk about this later when we get to public comment overview, but I fully anticipate this system to possibly be the subject of litigation. So my concern as an attorney, not only as an attorney, but one who does litigation on a regular basis, the public needs to understand that this is a huge undertaking that we have done with the library card for minors and for our staff to implement that they need clear directive and they need clear directive that is coming from a place of objectivity and consistency as was noted in the board reports and that's what i wanted to highlight um and anyway there's more i could say about the reports but i will i will refrain just talking about the implementation plan for the policy, which which um, may, we may hit on at other times. The policy, as we passed it, the policy as we passed this is particularly for everybody. <laughs> um, the policy as we passed it is on the website, and at the top of the policy, it says it is anticipated that the juvenile card will be in place July one and that the teen card will be in place by January 1. So it's got, it has dates that are publicly noted. Um, and I think that we have all been um, privileged, but at public meetings, we have all, uh, you know, so they have, these meetings have been open to the public, but we have all been privileged to hear the complexity of not only establishing a juvenile card, but in particular a teen card. By establishing the teen card, we are essentially, we have essentially established a policy to reconfigure the young adult department. So it is not, it isn't hollow by any means. It is reconfiguring an entire department, which is a big deal. Uh, not a big deal in thought, but if you look at the actual physical items that need to be dealt with on a technological basis and a physical basis, it's a big deal. So um sure I follow up on that. There's another part of our public education on the website was at least as patrons come into the library, I don't have a pamphlet with me, but we've had one that said uh, discovering the how to use your library or some mm -hmm. sort of thing. And I know I emphasized last time, let's be sure there's a stack up on the counter that anytime a parent comes and looks at a card for a minor, that either older version or new version that says, here's what we're working on, gets to those parents. So their expectation is understandable. I've signed up for this service and this uh, category, and they're in the works. Uh, and we do have those. We've actually ordered more recently. Uh, it's good. Um, and, you know, staff are encouraged to hand those out to help explain sure. to families what our collections actually have in them. And I think that's important. Expectations are half the challenge of life mm -hmm. anyway. And so if we can help them know that we're working on it, that there's a timeline, and they can expect timelines we have, some things to happen, but it may not all happen at once. And there are and there are already tools that are available. That's a good point. So and okay. while, while we're on the topic of communication, and maybe we'll get there in the director's report. But um, the district doesn't have a communications director, hasn't for a, a while. And that I'm sure is a factor in trying to get information to the public. Um, several people that have, I have talked to um, because of obvious current circumstances are uh, very interested about what the library is doing, but we don't have a communications director. Is that job posted? Um, are we seeing any interest? <laughs> Um, the job has been posted. We are currently conducting interviews and um, actually this afternoon we have an interview. So um, I am very hopeful. In the meantime, um, myself and our webmaster and a couple other staff are pitching in and doing the most that we possibly can to get messages out there. And um, I would love if we would have someone selected in the next week or two. <laughs> so it would be amazing. I would jump in on that because one of the communications things we've been fussing about was uh, 
And what you've done a good job with was educating the public that there's a vote coming up, mm -hmm. both the signs outside and the materials you're handing out to describe what the vote's all about, which does reach those who come to the library. Well, we somehow, as you get time, when you're done being the assistant administrator and the administrator and the communications person, we'll be telling that story and reaching out to folks who haven't yet discovered the library. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, we empower discovery. Uh, part of that joy is telling people, did you know that? And amazing things that are being to happen. Madam Chair, I found my library reports for April, but I didn't find them for March. They were in the packet that we received last month. Right. That was, was through. that was the little whispering yeah. we were doing over here. Sorry, but Judy was saying that I had last month's reports. And, and so what I'm saying is, them. Judy, I put them because we didn't get to talk about them at our last meeting. Right. I moved them forward. That's why I have them in front of me because we, okay, they so weren't they mind. weren't sent to us again. That's my they were in the former packet, but we didn't actually get to discuss them at our last meeting. Yeah. Okay, guys, Thank let's you. move. All right, are we done talking about the reports? Yeah. Okay, We're let's move on. Off the report. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, what about the uh, the circulation statistics? Our, you know, to echo what Jill said, like overall with all of our libraries, we continue to see about a 14% increase and people coming into our libraries compared to last year and about a 9% increase in circulation of material. And that's just across the board for everyone. Um, and then individual libraries are have will have higher or lower numbers. So, um, you know, to me, that just shows that we're doing our job and that we're offering the material that people want and we're creating a safe and welcoming environment for them to come in. Just think what will happen when we get a communication person going in. What a problem to have. Any questions or concerns? Yes, I had a question about the Freedel usage. Okay. I thought that that wasn't renewed. Is it not expired yet? Or I mean, why is there still usage? Um, so Freegal was, it's still currently under contract with our CIN as a whole, and that ends in May. And we decided um, to actually renew it one more year just for CLN libraries. So we are continuing that next year, starting in May. So just, okay, so the other libraries aren't? Yeah, CLN. Right, C just, CIN libraries will not have access after May. We will have it okay. for one more year. All right. Okay. All right, any other questions? All right, then the next item on the agenda is the director's report. Okay, so um, I have my written report, which I don't know that I need to go over again, but, um, and I wanted to talk about the communications coordinator. So we are interviewing for that position and we did interview um, for the adult programming coordinator position as well and that was filled by an internal candidate so I'm really excited for that individual and um, she will start in her role on May 1st so we've been able to do some promoting internally which is wonderful. Who is it? You tell them. Oh um, Marie Shockley she is a 40 hour circulation supervisor and adult programmer at Post Falls. Okay. So she's going to step into that role in a couple of weeks. And how do you back with her? Once she leaves that one, whatever she's doing now. Right. We are actually in the process of interviewing <laughs> for that as well, which will likely be another internal candidate. So it just <laughs> keeps going, <laughs> going. but it's yeah, good because I want to have people to have the opportunity to move up and become in full-time positions, so. I'm sorry, could I come back to the percentage growth? I was looking at your director's report. Tell us a minute ago, you said 13% growth in circulation. We have 9% increase in circulation and 14% increase sure. in people coming into the buildings. It's back here. Okay, we're, we're explaining it all at the same time. Okay. So, what, as you said, you said it's consistent with what Apple is experiencing. Are there any libraries that are not experiencing that kind of growth? Um, not that I can speak to off the top of my head. Yeah. No. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, 
in your February packet and then in your pack or in your March packet and also on your table packet today, there is a report that I created called the CLN request for reconsideration. And Vanessa, I think this might answer some of your questions, but these are the books that we have received reconsideration reports from our four um, in the last 18 ish months. And um, they're listed by title and the key issues that were identified by the individual who was submitting the report are the requests for reconsideration and then our response as a library to their reconsideration. Um, do you have final action column? Yes, yes. So um, what's uh, what's retained as classified? That means that we did not change where it was currently shelved. So that means if it was a easy fiction book, we kept it in the easy fiction section. OK, because like on that particular one, that just jumped out to me um, about in the middle, relocated from young adult fiction to adult fiction. So the fiction part is the re oh, retained as classified. OK, yes. gotcha. I gotcha. I was thinking like top secret classified. Oh. <laughs> catalog you could substitute catalog um what you can see in here is like empire of storms um was relocated from young adult to adult and we did that based on the minor card implementation plan so we took what was in the request submitted to us evaluated it based on what we intend to do with that new policy and then we just went ahead and did it on its you know separate on its own um we you can also see the ones that had their decisions appealed um such as george the decision was appealed to the board and then the board upheld the staff decision to keep it as juvenile fiction retained mm -hmm. So this, I'm hoping this will help you all understand our actions that we've taken so far. And we have, um, you know, relocated four of these materials, which shows that we are, you know, not just, this is not just a show or a tool that is not actually working. We are listening, we are taking steps and we are reevaluating and four of these items did get moved. And is it just to be assumed, because I don't think I see a, a column, that these are all teen books, children's books, it's, or 18 and under? It's all. Um, there are some that are easy fiction, which means it's a children's book. There's young adult books. And then there are ones that... And am I missing that on here? Does it say that on there? It says it right in here. So it was re relocated from okay, young adult okay, so to adult, adult, all right, or retained as adult. But I don't have it broken out I gotcha. into age ranges. Okay. Yeah. The juvenile. Right now we're using young adult as as it is. It's, yes. And right, and juvenile as it is. And young adult will be we call it we'll be, be calling it teen for the mm -hmm. cards. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So this list is a living document. I mean. If when we get more requests, we will add right. to it. When we implement our um, policy fully, you know, I can change some of the responses so that it's in a clearer language. So in this list of 13, covers a lot, how much time? Since when to when? Um, this covers from what I could find going back to October 2021. October 21, because I had about nine that occurred since in the last year or so. So mm -hmm. before then, October 21. So no. these on this, these are where actual the actual form was filled out yes, and yes, turned right. in. So we had something to work from. Right. right. Okay. It, it, this is not requests, just and verbal requests. Just that are, as a reminder, we do have 253,000 items in our collection, and we've only received 13 reconsiderations. So um you know we are more than willing to receive more and take the appropriate steps but it shows the, 
Right. So I'm trying to judge. Thank you. 253,000. Yes. Zero, zero, zero. Yes. <laughs> right. I had a question. Yes. Um, so is this a public document or I mean, could I share it with someone if they were interested or does it need to be a FOIA request? Um, it is an internal document right now that's been shared with the board. So um, I believe a FOIA request would be best. Um. This was um, when I saw that this was in my board packet, I was just tickled. I was okay. really happy. I've had these questions. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, again, people don't quite understand how this board operates. We we get a packet of materials, we review it, we discuss what's in those materials and on our agenda at the next meeting. So, you know, um, we don't always have all of the information that the public assumes that we have. So. This was wonderful. I counted that there were four requests for reconsideration in the calendar year 2022. Yeah. Um, I also really appreciated, and maybe you're going to get there, maybe not, but the public comment report. I'm going to talk about that next. Time. Okay, so I okay, I won't go there now. I won't go there quite yet. But um, this is, you can call it a bureaucratic tool if you want to, but the law requires the public to use mechanisms that have been put in place for public entities to do their jobs and the request for reconsideration is what this district has has available to the public to use i'm going to move on um, to the next report which is the public comment report and I put a new version or printed out again for your table packet today. Today, the date today. Yeah. It's the peak. Yeah, there's a date on it, 3-16-23. Um, this is something that I, so I just want to say that this is not an exhaustive list. Um, what I did was I went back through public comments starting October of 2021 through our minutes and try to pull out titles um, that could be e that could be identified because there have been a lot of titles thrown around or there have been photos of titles which you cannot see. Mm -hmm. So these are things that have actually been mentioned. And I wanted to just highlight um, if we actually have them in our collection, where they are shelved in our collection, and if any action has been taken, because some of these titles have been mentioned again and again. And I also wanted to identify the subject headings just so the board can, you know, have more information to see the actual titles and subjects that are being discussed by our community. Um, I can just do a quick synopsis so there's like 26 titles on here and our library owns 19 of the 26 so we don't even know own all of the titles that have been discussed so they identified on here the yes right. yes okay. but they can be brought in from like other um you know libraries okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay so on the by the column <laughs> and then of those 19 six of them were shelved in are shelved in adult. So these are not books in the kids section. These are actually in the adult section. And then five of the 19 are shelved in young adult. So that means eight of these 26 books we own and have in our children's area. And by children's, that is zero to 12. Sorry, could you say those numbers one more time? Yes. So eight of the 26 books we own and have in our children's wait, wait. collection. I think so. Oh, sorry. Okay. Eight of the 26 that are on here. Okay. Five are shelved in young adult, and six are shelved in the adult section. That's 14. That's should be 19. Right. It's six, five, and eight is 19. And then the others we don't own. 
Um, what I am really concerned about is that our public comment and other things that I've seen keep saying that these are all in the kids section. And Katie mentioned this earlier, our library has very distinct areas in it. There is children's for zero to 12, there is young adult for 12 to 18, and there is adult for over 18. And we need to identify that because we can't just make a statement that this is in kids because it, this is not true. And so I'm trying to clarify some of that misinformation that is out there. And I hope that this report will also help clarify some of that misinformation. Um, I just I have a comment, but it's understandable that if we define children different than the rest of society, that's not the rest of society's fault. I mean, it, you know, I mean, we, we have the right to do that, to say that this is children's and this is teens, this is young adults, but um, I, I, I think that it's not correct classify it as mm -hmm. as misinformation when that's the definition that most of society goes by is you know it means minors people under 18. for purposes of our discussion here though if we use the word children's department we need to we need to be clear um, because it is it's also misleading both ways so i think we need to be clear you know if it if a book uh, if a book the di many of much of the difficulties that we are experiencing happen because of our young adult collection. So for for internal discussion, we need to be really clear okay, about what that's fine. Um, but to say that the public is saying that they're is spreading misinformation when that's the definition that most of society goes by, it doesn't really seem fair. We also clarify this on our website and our documents and our PR documents. And so I think for me, this is the truth that we operate in, which is we have these classifications in the library and there is misinformation being shared about what we have. And, you know, that is how I see this. And I would chime in to say that as a board member, Rochelle, you clearly know the, the, the different categorizations between the children's sections and young adults. So I think to the extent that you are a board member, it is incumbent on you to correct all of us, yeah. the misinformation. And, 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 and I understand what you're saying. When the members of the public come in, they can call it what they want to call it. But you as a board member know how these books are classified. Um, I, so Am I, did you have to go back and re-listen to our board meetings to compile this list? Mm -hmm. um, okay, to be frank, I listened to a few, um, but it became traumatic for me in doing so. And so I opted to look at the minutes because I just couldn't handle that. I, no, I'm right there with you. I, um, I tried to go back and, and listen to quite a few of our YouTube videos because of misinformation that I believe is out there and, and misrepresented. But did you know on YouTube, you can find a transcript of, of what is said and the transcripts, you know, you can skim that a lot easier than the, the yeah, the rewatching. Um, so I was going to say this in public comment overview when we got there, but this is a better place to put it since we're, we're really focusing on the topic right now during your board report about the books that, um, the public is concerned about. So I, um, I finally, and, and I, don't, I don't, I mean, you, it seems like people think that we have these lists. We didn't have these lists. I now have the list of 800 books. The only reason I have the list of 800 books is because of the, um, uh, the campaign by Clean Books for Kids that is happening outside of our libraries to accost patrons and hand them flyers. And the flyers that are being handed out to our patrons that also have Community Library Network on the top, uh, which frankly I think is a misuse of the Community Library Network's logo. And um, as a, and I have asked, well, I'm potentially concerned about um, the public using the library systems trademark 
or um, trade dress without the permission of the district and trying to confuse the public as to whether this is information being put out by CLN or if this is you know, a misinformation campaign to oust Judy and I from this board. Be that as it may, the flyer had a QR code at the bottom that took you to this list. So since the last meeting, since March, I, I, have, I have looked at this 800 um, list and also I have clearly read the press coverage about the election in which my opponents are saying this is the list. This is the list that they want to come in here and clean out of the library. And so um, I, I need to be very clear to my fellow board members out of this list of 800, 65% of these books are on this list because of the because they evidently have a gay character. That is the coding at the bottom of the list, category G equals gay. So I counted the, the books on here that are on this list solely because of a gay character. I did not include S's, I did not include GI's, I did not include the T's for trans. I only counted the clean books for kids 800 list or G's 65% are on this list because of a because of gay characters. Um, the United States Supreme Court in Bostock versus Clayton County has um, expanded discriminatory and protected classifications to include um, gays. Members of the public may not like that, but they are a protected class. So we have right here in simple black and white that clean books for kids wants this district to take 65% um, of these 800 books out of the library system because they have a gay, gay character. That is blatantly content and viewpoint discrimination that this district cannot engage in. And if this district takes that step, uh, this board member believes that litigation will follow. Um, I don't have it in front of me because I put my phone away, but there was litigation in Texas, very similar. I believe the case is called Llano County. I know that's the library district involved. Um, federal district judge ordered the library system to put back the 17 books that were removed because of content or viewpoint discrimination. As a public entity, and as elected officials, I believe that we owe um, fiduciary duties to this district to not subject it to litigation. So if I'm not seated with the, this board anymore in two months from now, I would caution my um, I would caution you as a board to not engage in blatant discriminatory practices. Um, I could be wrong, but it was my understanding that. The, the list that you're refer referring to there was made for parents as a reference. Like if you're concerned about these things, then these might be books that you're Susan. that you might not want to give your children. Um, I'm anyway. Go ahead. I I, I appreciate you saying uh, something, Rochelle, because that just reminded me of something else I wanted to say, which is that um, we are being we this board are being accused of not having taken action. Um, the, the conversation has morphed over time from being about one thing to being about another. Um, when we moved into, this is an issue of sexual explicitness that our um, public believes um, is in the, that books are in the teen section that ought not be in the teen section, this board, this board took action about that. So, and now we're being told that it's just the sexually explicit content. With this list, proves to me is that the undertone has been the same from the beginning, which is the real the real problem that Clean Books for Kids has is the LGBTQ content. And this makes it very obvious if 65% of the books on this list are on this list because of because they are LGBTQ, because not even that they're LGBTQ, they just happen to have an LGBTQ character. So what I'm trying to speak to is in response to the public comment that to suggest that uh, what I'm now hearing out there is that this is solely about sexual explicitness. 
I don't believe that to be the case. I believe that this group has an agenda and that group's agenda is the LGBTQ content that's housed in our collection. You're assuming uh, that you know how someone else thinks um, and perhaps the reason why 65% of them are is maybe because CLN is really pumping the minor sections full of I, books that Okay, have wait a second. I would like to see some. Yeah. Okay. So I have looked at this list as well. The one I had had around 700 titles. And I want to just say that we have 253,000 items in our library. And out of that list of 700, we have about 1,000 copies of items that are on that list. That means we have 4% of our collection that makes up this list. So it is not correct of you to say that we are pushing this material when it literally comprises only 0.4% of our collection. Also, the list that is out there misrepresents where some of the items are located and it misrepresents the subject matter. And I do have a list that we created with the actual information on there. And in relation to what you were saying, Regina, of the 700 titles, 437 are categorized as gay, 51 with gender identity, and 45 with transgender. And when I see that, that is blatant viewpoint discrimination, and that is not something that the library can or should be part of. And it is not correct that we are pushing this agenda in our collection. Our statistics do not prove that to be the case. Anything else? All right, Virginia, you're done? I am. Okay. Um, all right, then. Actually, sorry, I did have one more question. Is this another internal document or is this a public document? I don't have, I have a list that has been reviewed by library staff that is an internal document. Yes. Then I think I think you're talking about. Are you talking about the public comment report? Uh, yes, it's a internal document. Okay. Thank you. But it's still we were puzzled before. But uh, the list you have is different or small, shorter than the 800 you have. The one I have was a 401 and then a 601. It, it's morphing all around. So it is a moving is target. Yes. And, uh, the list. Is, we need to be careful when we say the list, is to, which is why we're back to learning your list because it could be any version of these, which helps us, I think, as a board deal with the issue uh, and have an important discussion. And then whatever policy we do is up to us, but the implementation is still back to staff. And OK, so back to my question of few agenda items ago. Um, because you, I think you touched on it, but I didn't get an exact. Mm -hmm. uh, so when it comes to the books that the public would like moved or gotten rid of, that. is that only by reconsideration, them handing in reconsideration forms, or is it also librarians on their own looking for books, or they hear Mm -hmm. in the public and so they go look at the books on their own um i just and i'm asking so it can be clear to the public of which which way this goes or does it go both ways um so we had our first um implementation meeting for the library card for mm -hmm. minors mm -hmm. and when we meet again this week we're going to be finalizing that decision because I do believe that we could take one of these lists and begin our journey there, especially for the young adult material, and begin evaluating okay. to make sure we have those materials cataloged correctly according to the policy. Um, when we do hear about specific titles, we are evaluating them as they are presented to us. Through the reconsideration forms, or just hear about hear about. Okay. So it is a mixture of both. Prior, it was just through reconsiderations, but we are trying to change tactic and make sure we are sure. looking at them as we hear about them. Okay. Now, is that going to make it harder for the library to keep a record of 
what books were moved and and why without that form turned in in the first place? Um, it's it will not because we are establishing standards um, that will be applied for this new policy mm -hmm. and so they will be put up against those standards and then that would be what would be the justification or explaining why something was changed okay yeah okay well as much as i would like to leave this topic and, and go to the next one i do want to speak to um that that i have only taken any sort of action because of an impending election um, when we changed the material selection policy, that was that was purposeful. We changed the material selection policy. What crystallized for me after we did that is no, it was much more recent than that. Um, what crystallized for me after we changed after we updated the material selection policy was when staff came back and explained to us how they would approach that which is to use existing obscenity law and existing obscenity law requires um, judging the book as a whole. Yeah. And I, I, I don't disagree with staff about that. that. That is what existing law requires is that books be um, considered as a whole. So that in my mind, and again, you know, I'm sorry, I'm an attorney. I, I do move slowly. Maybe I am an impediment. I have no idea. <laughs> I, I'm, um, you know, if that's a, law, I'll try to overcome it. But um, th that that is true. That's how the law approaches things. So that changed things for me, which is OK. If um, staff look at this policy and they're going to judge books as a whole, then that then this policy is maybe not quite the fit for answering what it is that we've been hearing from the public. And so then this board crafted the library card for minors policy, which I think does speak to the concerns that we're hearing from the public regarding sexual explicit content um, in the young adult section. So um, not that I need to. I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. and then I would join in too that as we look at this and live it, it can be changed. The policy is one that we're trying to deal with, but as you live it, you can come back to us as any board should be doing and living. This part works right. This part doesn't. It's an ongoing. It is not frozen. Mm -hmm. At least my expectation is that's what we'll learn from you as we go along. Thank you. OK. Um, shall we move on? Yes. So the next item on our <laughs> agenda is our library tour. And um, after our tour, you can take a break. Um, but we do have, I, I want us to come back as quickly as possible because it is 11, we have till 1230, but the budget discussion is vital. So, um, okay. all right. And so it's we Jill. Um, well, I, the tour will probably take a few minutes, 15 minutes, and then you get five. That's very exciting. Budget discussion is now starting. Yay. Um, and the first thing is that we need to hear from our staff on everything they'd like to tell us. OK. Um, last year when McGrath Human Resources were here, um, they shared with us that they would be willing to help us in future years figure out um, <laughs> cost of living and merit and just where we need to be headed. And so um, we reached out to McGrath Human Resources Group and um, they walked us through a couple of scenarios that they um, would recommend that we bring to the board and bring forward for discussion. Um, so I want to say that um, what we included in your table packet is something that you guys already have, which is the adopted salary schedule for fiscal year 23. But I just wanted it to be with you right now so you can see it as we talk through this. Thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. And then um, we have on these purple pages a write up of what the scenarios are and then 
Janelle created um, salary schedules and then the overall financial cost of the salary schedules for each of the three scenarios. So it is hopefully visible for everyone um, to see and understand what we're talking about. So um, I will say it feels so early to be talking about this, but I know that we're actually not early at all. This is where we need to be. So, um, and Lindsay, that's because we have to have approved and begin functioning by what date for the new budget? Um, well, you mean the, the reason we're, we're going to lead us through the timeline. Right. So we have to um, have, well, we need to have a budget hearing set by April 30th for oh. this coming year. Right. And then we need um, to have all of this in place at the very latest by like August, that like because be there's a lot of paperwork yeah. and governmental documents that need to be submitted. So, and yeah. that's one thing we need to make sure we do today is set that. But we already briefly talked about when we would have the budget hearing, but we need to make sure we set that in the um, later on in the and agenda. Federal, okay. Okay. So what I'm going to do is go through. Um the scenarios and the first scenario is um essentially a below market scenario and what that is is we would move staff from the temporary minimum that we um have for this year into the recommended salary range mm -hmm. for fiscal year 23 and then staff that are not impacted by that move would receive a 5% salary increase. And um, the reason this is a below market scenario is that we are already kind of lagging behind because we didn't implement the recommended minimum last year. So we are already playing catch up by only getting to that point this year. Um, so that's scenario one. Um, and it costs, it's the estimated increase over this year's budget is $328,000 to get staff to the um, recommended minimum and do the 5% increase for everyone else. Who's not impacted by that? So that's really the minimum. So that's yes. the increase, the difference between with the 87% reduction. That, yes, yeah, okay. that is correct. So that's those those were the columns we'll be comparing. What I, you know, I would be comparing like what did we what was last year? What are you proposing for this year? Yeah. Okay. And then that is at the 87% minimum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So then the next scenario is low market, which means we are would be within the market range for our area, but on the lower end. And um, this would include a taking the recommended minimum and increasing it by 3% to adjust for the annual increase and then move everyone out of the temporary minimum into that newly adjusted recommended minimum. And then staff that are not impacted by that would get a 7% salary increase. And we would also apply compression to those staff who are impacted by the move to the recommended minimum. Um, and this scenario would cost an additional $447,000 from our budget, our staffing budget that we have for this year. Um, and what that does is that um, gets us up to the recommended minimum, plus it allows for um, a raise for this year. So it brings us up to the market rate, and then it gets that 7% for staff who are not affected by the move to the minimum. I don't know if that makes sense to everyone. 
<laughs> Do you want me to ask the question now or at the end? You can ask. Okay. When you say apply compression, and I remember what compression is, but what do you mean by apply? Yes. So, um, wait a second. Let's start with what compression is. Yes. <laughs> so, compression is when you have someone who's been here three years and someone who just started making almost the same amount. And that means they are compressed on the salary schedule. When you apply a compression formula, you um, the one we have here is like, let's say we do have someone who's been working three years. They would get an additional 2% added to their base salary so that they're making a little bit more than someone who just started in that position. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then the final scenario is what is called the mid market um, scenario. And this is doing everything that we did in the low market, um, which is increasing this recommended range 3%, moving staff into that recommended range, giving staff who aren't affected by that 7% salary increase, and then applying compression to everyone in the organization that needs it. So this is recognizing longevity across the board for our staff, and that's not something that is currently happening. Um, so we would be following the compression formula. So let's say you have an employee who is not impacted um, by them moving to the minimum, but they are a library manager and they've been here for four years, they would get 7% increase plus a longevity compression formula of an additional 2% to move them into a mid-market range. Um, <clears throat> I Part of the conversation that I had with McGrath and um, it was interesting because she said, Lindsay, you need to ask yourself who wants to work in the public library anymore. Mm -hmm. And she said, the answer is it's those people who care about the library, those people who are public servants with the servant heart, who value their community. And we're fortunate to have staff already in place who want to work here but we need to continue to support them in working here and recognizing their service, recognizing that this is a volatile environment, recognizing that everyone doesn't want to be in this job anymore. And we are in a difficult and challenging place and we need to work hard to create a safe, appreciated, valued compensation plan for our staff to continue to do their jobs. Um, so I just wanted to put that out in the universe. I would like to say that um, I get this, I get to hear about this from my daughter who works second tier up from the bottom at the Fort Vancouver um, downtown library. And these same issues are facing them and the pressures that, uh, and I, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that biggest changes come to our, our lowest level staff. Is that correct? That's correct. It's the staff that are working, you know, four of their six hours every day on the front lines. They're the ones who are fielding questions about, show me where the porn is in the library, or do you really have disgusting porn in the library, who are, you know, confronted with these conversations daily, and who continue to do their job with a smile on their face. And by having a team that supports them and encourages them to do so. We're lucky um, not to be a downtown library. They've had to close their fourth and fifth bathroom and it states on the front, uh, it's due to fentanyl use mm -hmm. and it's making the people who clean the bathrooms ill. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh-huh, uh, no, we're, well, yeah, we're, um, that's a downtown, that's a downtown big city library. It's like an urban setting. Yeah. Um, what I'm what I'm trying to say is um, what Lindsay's saying about the pressure. We none of us work frontline um, 
in the library, we have no idea what that feels like. And even in our community, which probably isn't closing bathrooms due to fentanyl use uh, at this point in time, we need to understand that this is a very challenging situation. And this, and to retain staff, um, the um, for for us to be looking at this is vital. Sorry. No, I I'm I don't know if you all have questions or you know what you what is next. Um. Down here at the bottom, it says considerations for the board for future budget cycles. Does it mean future budget cycles like not right now or this? this oh, I'm sorry. This is just um like for fiscal year 25 and so forth. It's like saying that, you know, this doesn't end here. It's um other things that we'll want to look at is adding, you know, paid, oh, I see. paid leave for our Percy part-time staff. Um, and then there could be decisions like for the board, because what I don't want is for the board. I want the board to feel integrated into this and to feel like they are making this decision for staff. And, you know, it could be that we look at, let's say this year we have a 5% adjustment and the board, you know, says, OK, well, why don't we do 3%? um for merit and two percent for cost of living or there's conversations about what those increases look like and the board's input on that so i just wanted to put those ideas out there thank you so do you have a does the staff have a recommendation or where they'd like to see us be or um well <laughs> 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 i that same face <laughs> 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 I don't know. Uh, full disclosure, I wasn't going to be at this meeting today, as you all know. Um, so I actually got didn't get 100% through the packet. I was going to, but I didn't know I needed to. I found out yesterday I was going to be here. So yeah. I hadn't looked at the purple pages until just now. So on the first page of each one where it says total wages, what is that number compared to in the back? with the at scheduled hours and I, I know what the 87% reduction is, but what is that uh 308-909 number? Which which figure? Um on any of them, okay. this number the versus total wages. The total wages on the front is literally the total of the wages. And then on the back it is the full compensation package. Okay. Which includes Confirm. benefits. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, Perfect the insurance Thank premiums, you. things like that. It's what we actually would be paying out throughout the year. Okay, perfect. And then over here is obviously the approved um, fiscal year 23. Yes. Of what we, okay. And that that includes all uh, tax, I mean, not taxes, uh, mm -hmm. uh, insurance Benefits. and taxes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All right, thank you. And back to Katie, your question about what does staff recommend? I mean, I, in, an absolute beautiful and mm -hmm. loving, sweet place. It would be great to do the mid market. It would be really amazing if we could get to low market in this scenario. I think that would put us at where we need to be. We would not be a year behind again. We would be able to raise the salary range, get everyone moved to the recommended and recognize the work of those who have been here that aren't also getting movement from the minimums. Does the does the low market, I don't, maybe I skipped it. Does it say anything about dealing with the issue of compression? Um, we would be applying compression oh, oh, it's right here. for the staff affected by the movement to the recommended minimums, but it would not give compression or longevity to the other staff. Okay, and I thought that the mid market was the preferred place to be if we're taking into consideration the information from the graph. Am I wrong about no, that? No, you are right. I it just feels scary to say that, but that's what we the preferred would be that. Okay. And I want to recognize that that's a big ask. Um, 
I that would there. be my number one request that mid, we get to there. Mid market. Mm -hmm. Did they have a high market? Um, no. <laughs> they didn't. Okay. All right. We just go to mid, huh? Okay. Just curious. Do you happen to have a percentage of the well, all of them, I suppose, but the mid market? What percentage? of the overall budget would go to the salaries and package because I know we're always looking uh -huh. at what, like 68 or something like that percent. We are not yet there, but okay. I hope in a week or two we will have okay. more information like that to share. That was going to be my question toward the end is, you know, would it be possible? I, one of the things that I think is going to be happening and I'm going to push it is some special meetings concerning budget budgeting because we are actually behind and we have this huge consideration, which usually a salary um, scenario isn't as isn't as big a deal as it, this one is. And um, so my request would be that we have a special meeting in a couple of weeks. And if we can begin to see this, what this would look like in a ballpark full budget, you know, um, so that would be um, because that would be what I would say as well. Man, I would say I, I also think that the percentages that we've held to, we may have to look at and understand we've held to those percentages and they've kept us below market, way below market, and that we may have to change. And those are the percentages that we've held to are low for a service industry. And we are, that's what we are, mm -hmm. mainly a service industry. Um, so that's the reality. Mm -hmm. Sorry, these are the realities. And then, and then I'm sure the the uh, I think we'd all like to be mid market. That'd be easy. It's just what you guys are defining as what did that do to the rest of the budget? And part of that will be measuring since we're a service industry, the most important thing we have may not be our product as much as it is the people who help us sell that product to service people. And what we'll want to watch for is if we do it for one year just for catch up, does it set us up for being there forevermore? And those are the, the ripples that that uh, another round of numbers will help us see. Mm -hmm. uh, part of that is, you know, what are we going to skip because we want to be sure and get everybody up to speed on unemployed costs? Because we know that longevity has great value rather than retraining or refining people if they're even willing to join it. Uh, every study you ever see in a business world is keep the people you have if they're good and prune the others and get on with it because you want to have good ones to stay with you. And that's the most cost effective way to do it. Which is over the years has always been a hard discussion for us to have. Um, I appreciate the the different salary range scenarios that you've put together and and walked us through. And I think the paragraph at the bottom considerations for future is is really key because so often, you know, <laughs> I mean, the district hires a consultant, they prepare a really nice report, the board <laughs> read the report, it gets filed away never to be looked at again. And so like putting it on here and keeping it kind of uppermost in the in our minds is important because we had that study and analysis done for a reason. And it showed that we are um, woefully um, that our staff are are underpaid, and that the recommendation is to correct that. And that that would be good business judgment of us to do. I have something to say. Okay. So the difference between um, the below market and the low market is um, the difference between those increases is 119,000 and the difference between low market and mid market is 40. Um, One the, more time, Katie. The difference, yes. just the difference. So, Numbers, huh? so um, I'm looking at the at the increases that are that are required that. and I yeah. did some math to do that. Um, so we get from below to the low market, it's gonna cost us another 119, did I hear you say? To get from below to low market yeah. is another 119. Okay. And then from low to mid is 40. 
So if you did the, everything all at one time, it would be 119 plus the 40. Mm -hmm. Goal. Okay. But the big jump is from below yeah. to low. Yeah. And and one of the things that, um, you know, I was, and and maybe I'm being too blunt here, but I'm just going to do it anyway. <laughs> um, we passed, you know, a, a halfway jump to the um, with this with the salary recommendations last year, mm -hmm. and I was feeling very pleased about that because we hadn't done something as organized as that, and I loved I loved the presentation of the consult the consultation that we got, and um, and yet we heard from staff that they were ticked, you know. Well, we heard from. I would say not all. Yeah, staff. We, no. we, heard, we got an email who claim to represent staff. Yeah. So I'm wondering if we. OK, so in in what I've been talking about lately. That may be true, but there also may be kernels of truth in those mm -hmm. those kinds of things that come at us that it's like, you know. Um, just because they're mad doesn't mean they aren't right. <laughs> um, so um, my concern would be, you know, we would protect the um, staying below market feels like an enormous slap in the face to staff. That that we, but are we protecting the library by not by? Sticking to low market and not going actually up to mid market, which is another forty thousand dollars, which isn't the biggest jump. Um, and so I guess um, I want us to be cognizant of that. This is a tough. This is a tough time to work. I would say with the public, target anybody. I would say it's a tough time to work with the public. And most of these people are working with the public. Mm -hmm. So I would like us to look for that. There is, we, we are there and I think as a board, we can say that we are having to right wrongs that should have been righted in other ways earlier. That we should, we, um, you know, the ultimate blame, you know, the buck does stop here, um, I mean, with, with the board, but we weren't in a good place to look at it. We had a director that was leaving and we had COVID and it, you know, we simply weren't. Um, but it is, but we are playing catch up in a big way. And would it be better just to move to move to total catch up and have, be done with it? So if not, the catch up goes on. Right. Then there's mustard. Then there's mustard. Right. And it was, I even <laughs> obviously saw that coming. <laughs> I didn't disappoint you, did I? <laughs> so the next step would be um, if we ask staff to, I, I don't know what the next step is. So I'm, so I'm going to throw this out and then we can talk about it. Um, ask staff if they can, and, and this is not going to be easy because they don't have numbers, um, clear numbers yet. Um, but to put together a full budget that would include which one of these, and my sense would be that it would include that would it include the mid market to see what that put us at. We could always go below. We've done that before too. And um, because, in all fairness, that's where we should be. Doesn't that only catch us up for now? No, all we're doing is catching up. That part I can't. Year. I don't. I can't answer that. What happens next year? I mean, so next year, like if we address longevity now, if we address compression now, um, next year it would be determining the overall um, cost of the raise for everyone and how much. But we wouldn't have to do a big jump like this next year or the next year. Your biggest expense would probably be deciding if you want to do the paid leave for um, part-time Percy staff, which I believe is one fifty to $180,000. So that would be the next big expense. But next year, it would just be that annual raise that you would be deciding for everyone. It, it seems to me that we spent the money we did having this 
looked at hiring that company was McGrath. McGrath, sorry. Um, for a reason, right? <laughs> Not so that um, we keep it, especially below um, or low. I'm sorry, yeah, wait, below. Yeah, below is the lowest. Um, and catching them up to where they should be. And like Judy was saying, otherwise we're just going to be chasing, chasing how far behind we are. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. And then the years to come until maybe 10, 15 years from now, we have to do another study <laughs> like that 10 or 15 years and see that maybe we're behind again. Uh, but each year after being caught up is the yeah. merit mm -hmm. or cost of living, but merit hopefully as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, more important um, raises. So then, Vanessa, are you saying back to Katie's point as far as like what budget preparation you'd like to see from staff? Is are you are you saying you'd like to see mid market what that would look like? I know it's a shock to all on the board, but yes, I know, go ahead. yes, I am. I think catching up to mid market and then the um, increases yearly Should be. would make more sense, especially since we did the study for a reason. Um, and the lump sum to catch them up, you know, it, it will come from other places, not snow removal. <laughs> you know, there's certain things it's not going to come from, it might come from uh, material. Um, acquisition, but um, like somebody said, I don't remember, but having the people working here is, is vital to the public actually receiving the books in the first place. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, I'm sure that nobody here wants to shortchange the staff, um, but I would also be interested in looking at the low market salary range and the, the budget workup. If we had it, we could subtract it. If we had it high, we could subtract and see where we were at. But we could look at both of them, perhaps. I think we know that that's not going to happen, though, if we have the budget come out with the, the mid-market range. No, I was right. I was thinking, but then I was also thinking that they, they do that for us as well with um, provide us with a couple of scenarios for the 1%, 2%, right. you know, that kind of thing. So, so th that's what I was thinking. Is that going to be complicated? But it's not any more complicated. So at this point in time, we're looking at we're not looking at below market. I'm not hearing that. We're looking at lower mid. Okay. And so if we could have scenarios that would, and and I think it's going to be really um, important for us to um, remember that the budget that will be presented will be very ballpark. You know, not these numbers. These numbers will be very clear, but the rest of much of it will be ballpark and we can talk about what's ballpark when we meet together. You know, what are the ballpark things? Yes. yes. Another question, and I don't know how much of my grand folk did with what are the comparable salaries in the neighborhood with Coeur d'Alene West Spokane? Was that factored into what they did? Oh, absolutely. In their study, it was so we can bring that we can bring part of that study back, back to. Too. The table and and do we know what they're going to do? They the comparable folks, the folks that will hire away our staff. Do we have any I don't know that there? yet. I no, I don't. But that's another level of retaining folks that we have, mm -hmm. or even moving some to come join us. She did a lot of that comparison when she gave her presentation, yeah. so she was looked at. Also, you found them pretty helpful. I mean, she. At the end of our presentation, she was like, holy man, you know, please use us. Right. And that's she was amazing. She was very generous with her time. And um, I yeah, I can speak to her again and just get more clarity if that would help. I, no, I just I, I mean, I think that 
they did a really good job of looking at and she addressed it a lot. But that was last year. By the time we begin to do this, whatever she's learned oh. may have what we see happening is huge increases. Yeah, but if you're talking going above mid market, then we that's not really even a discussion right now. That's fair. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> Except that we just keep watching that. Well she well, but she did do that with with these didn't she i mean she was with these scenarios she was like well now you're a year behind and so right that's right. right you know right. so she's like do you want to continue to lag behind this year we pay the price every time we're behind. right so mid market brings us to not lagging yes low market brings us to less lag <laughs> we've been that we've already said that yeah, we we know we're we're below less lag. <laughs> okay, so that will be the next step. And when we get to when we get to um 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 um, um, um set special meetings, we will work on setting a meeting yeah. for that. Before we leave, then uh, we think about you know, all the number crunching you and you know, all the team have to do. Um, you'll begin to see things that you might want to highlight to us and. When you do this, take us there as fast as I can figure it out. And, and it doesn't have to have the answers, it's just issues. Identifying like you did here, to me, it's very helpful about, okay, now we've got everybody up to the market. But what have we traded for? Right. And even some of the, you could do this or you could do that. You figure out which one we have to hold our nose. You know what it is? Yeah. Uh, it, will be, it doesn't look like it's going to be fun. No, but it's important enough that I'm going to get started on it. And have a special meeting to work on tomorrow. Right. Um, okay, the next item on the agenda is succession planning, and I will tell you where we are at with that. This is not executive session, right? Nope. Okay. This is not executive session. Um, the um, employment agreement got revised and sent. As we met about last week to do. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and sent to our preferred candidate and um, I followed up with them and they did receive it. Um, I asked that they try to get back with us by Monday the 24th, whether that, you know, it's possible, you know, because that probably will take them. And um, so that's a possibility that will then, and then Katie Brereton sent me an email and said, there are things that need to be taken care of. The board needs to approve the uh, in, Employment agreement as it was changed, and then if it gets signed, you know we have another we have another layer there of this. Um, um, so there are steps which I'm going to go back with Katie Brereton and make sure that I know what the steps are. But they, I am what I am saying to you is I would like us to plan a special meeting for next week for succession planning because I don't want to have a week go by without meeting with you guys. I'm out of time next week. But the update really is that there is no update <laughs> other than there was we no were, rejection. there was no rejection, okay. right? We were able to forward the proposal. So, okay. We'll have yeah. a look at it. Right. Cool. So we're still moving along. Slowly. Yeah. Um, okay. And that's all there is. Looking today. at the calendar now or? No, they, with oh. special meetings. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Okay. Okay, and then the next thing on the agenda is the strategic plan quarterly update, which we've never had before. This is brand new, very exciting. Well, hasn't it been on the agenda though for the last uh, couple of months, months, and we months. just have never gotten there? So wow, we've arrived! I'm so excited. Well, and we know in February, didn't we? We didn't no, get to it. No, this is it. This is that. On it was in the packet. I know. Okay. Does that count? <laughs> no. <laughs> this is it. We got to go over it now. Got to look at it. And it printed weird, like some of the dots are colored, some are not. Mm -hmm. They should just all be colored. So mm -hmm. just they don't have a secret meaning. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, you know, the board worked with library strategies to develop the strategic plan. Then from that plan is an implementation plan that the library staff worked with library strategies that is very detailed with very specific tasks for what we are doing to meet our goals. And then 
this document, which is the dashboard, um, is how we communicate what's happening with the implementation plan to the board members. So, um, so far this first quarter, um, because each of the tasks on the implementation plan has a due date by quarters, you know, for the next three years and associated staff that are responsible. Um, so this quarter we, for goal one, we were um, focused on effectively engaging teens as both participants and creators of programs and events. So um, our youth services staff identify teachers and staff in schools with whom to collaborate and then they met with teens to identify programming opportunities. So that is something that's in progress. Um, we've also expanded um, to have evening story time, Saturday STEAM programs, and Saturday homeschool programs. So we can meet the families that are working Monday through Friday and give them um, resources on the days that they have off. And for um, goal number two, um, it said to collaborate with early learning providers to create a well-coordinated educational ecosystem. So part of that beginning that process is we created a map of all current youth service collaborations. Um, and it literally is a map that shows where we are and where we are connected within the community. Um, which is really wonderful to see what we've done and then the areas that are lacking as well. Um, down to goal number three, we had to um, empower patrons to confidently access and use library resources through greater awareness, training, and usability. So for that, we have begun an audit of our library's website ADA capabilities so that we are in compliance with that. Um, and, you know, this goal can also just be seen in like the things that Jill reported on in her monthly, on her report, like we are um, promoting at community events, we are um, promoting voter awareness, you know, that is something that we, so this is, it's a broad goal and it's something that if I listed every single thing that we're doing, there would not be enough space. So I just, you know, we're going to list the highlights there. Um, the next thing that we did was curate collections that residents um, see as relevant and reflective of the community's needs. So for that, we updated the material selection policy and clarified the process for the reconsideration request. We responded to purchase suggestions from the community and added 71% of those to our collection. And we created the library card for minors and began the implementation plan. Next, um, under goal four, it said to expand communication throughout the service area and through multiple channels. So we began sharing our board packet online for ease of access and transparency. And we published our two page annual report highlighting the library successes and partnerships. And, you know, this particular goal will definitely grow and expand once we have our communications coordinator on board. And for goal number five, um, invest in library staff by completing and implementing an updated staff compensation plan. So that is in the green. That means it is on track. It has been completed because we did the McGrath study. So that's great. And then um, create robust onboarding and training plans for staff and board members. So we are in the process of creating a procedure manual for staff mm. that will provide the foundation for future training and onboarding of staff. Um, so what I'm going to do with our uh, managers and coordinators is, you know, we will meet at least once a quarter. We have assignments that we are working on. And then we will report our progress that we make sure we're adhering to this plan and that we're staying on track to the best of our abilities. 
So I don't know if you have specific questions about this. The first one would be what you just described, that you're going to be doing quarterly, so then we would hear from you the next month after that quarterly meeting to say. Like in June, actually, like if we stick yep. to the original quarterly sure. plan. I mean, I mean, be exactly. But that yeah. follow-up accountability when you all meet and then knowing that you're going to have to talk to the board mm -hmm. gives you focus. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would look forward to hearing from you. We have a number of, this is a ridiculous question because I'm kind of knowing the answer, but I was thinking maybe you could talk on it a little bit. Things that have derailed us. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, I have like some guilt that I carry about the strategic plan just because um, we had really big plans when it mm -hmm. was live in the beginning. And we are doing our absolute best, but, you know, for me, serving in both roles has diminished my ability to focus on this. And we have um, staff who are serving in dual roles for adult programming and communications. Mm -hmm. And um, we still keep this at the forefront, but we, I would say that we're not as, as along as we want to be, but that doesn't mean that's going to be like that forever. So um, we have faced challenges for sure <laughs> that have kept us busy. So, Are there specific areas where you are looking forward to pushing forward more quickly than others? Um, I, my, like, I want us to continue to push forward on expanding evening and weekend offerings because I do think we are missing a big part of the population that is at work during our regular programming. And um, we are having staff focus on intergenerational programming, which was heavily discussed in the strategic plan and what that can look like. And um, having people in the community with expertise be part of our programming and share their natural knowledge with us. Mm -hmm. So I think that's just making us an even tighter knit community. So I'm looking forward and getting us headed that way. Okay, good. Um, I appreciate the, the high level look um, for a quarterly report, but we also in our library board reports each month, I like how staff focus their reports towards yeah. one of the particular mm -hmm. goals in the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, that is something that we're able to, I guess, keep abreast of. But it, like you say, Lindsay, it's important to kind of look at the overview and how are we doing with respect to the entire strategic plan. So I'm really, really glad we finally got to this agenda item. And uh, yeah, look forward to future updates. Thank you. Thank you. And I see this weaving tightly with our budgeting. You're suggesting things where if we're open on Saturdays, is that going to cost more money? Mm -hmm. Because that's okay. It's okay. It's just it's always a job to integrate what you want to do with what you can afford to do when you can get it done. But I think that's what leadership is helping us as a board figure out with you. The Saturday programs that would be adding actual open hours or no we have um libraries that are open on saturdays but it's rearranging some staff schedules mm -hmm. so that they're not working monday through friday gotcha. possibly working tuesday through saturday gotcha. or having you know someone flex their schedule to come in and do a saturday program so as you go into summer that's always more of an issue too so it just takes a lot of cogitating time to make it happen and it's fair, I think, that it's this board at least, that you give it a try and if it doesn't work, we change it. Mm -hmm. That's okay, too. You won't know unless you test some things. And I think we've seen before, very my branches do have different criteria for hours they're open and where they are and what the kind of the marketplace is for that community. Mm -hmm. But the sense of developing libraries as a community center was part of our plan way back in the beginning because there's no other community center in some of these small rural areas. And when the bookmobile comes, it's a community, and then these drives away. So it's the uh, nice thing about the southern part of the county. We just don't have any facilities. And I have visited with the tribe a little bit more about their thinking in time. Another thing to be looking at there, because mm -hmm. Keith Allen is particularly supportive, ready to be more supportive. And I told him we'd assure him of an opportunity to do that. <laughs> 
All right. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the next item is trustee continuing education. We don't have anything at the moment. Um, facilities updates. Yes, so we have been doing like some preventative maintenance on our HVAC. We <laughs> have just done some like our annual fire extinguisher inspection. Hayden is getting repainted and the interior is getting repainted by our facility staff. And um, we are making progress on the post falls remote remodel of the children's room. Like I mentioned this, so it feels like ages ago, yeah. but we have um, donations for a remodel of the children's area. And we're getting to where we have some cost estimates and um, that will be something that needs to be brought forward to the board for consideration and things like that. <clears throat> Following in on the HVAC, as we had in the summer and air conditioning, is that going to cause a pinch point? For the budget? Or for getting the work done and therefore we cost. Summertime often the load on air conditioning is tougher than it is in the wintertime. I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> okay. Randy, do you Randy, have an Randy, answer? Yeah. No, I love you. I don't anticipate you to say that too loudly. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that's it. Okay, legislative updates. Anything we want to highlight? I saw the information in the packet for uh, end of the session terminations, and I appreciate the governor's leadership there. And it looks like we have our work cut out for us to continue to educate legislators to the good things that libraries are doing. Which brings us back to remember in the days when you want to finish my sentence. It, well, um, when we used to have uh, uh, legislator legislative invites, and I was talking to a legislator recently who reached out to me. I was, Boy. yeah, I was surprised. I was really pleased, um, and that person was asking for in, more information about libraries and. Um, was also saying that the fall is a great time, is a great time, you know, and it was impactful for me that that person reached out to me. I was like, whoa, okay. Um, that, that's one person who, you know, I, you know, my big concern is that the legislature has not, is passing legislation that affects the libraries without talking to at least talking to the library community about what is what's what's the point of view over here what what is how does that impact what does this mean and anybody who reaches out a little bit i think it's phenomenal um but i think we need to you know i i didn't mean to take up your 2.5 minutes and you owe me <laughs> um but it is true um that just just that person reaching out to me made me like, all right, fine, we'll we'll do it. We'll do something for the fall. And the story is that Judy was right. Judy was absolutely <laughs> right, and I've ignored her for a hundred years because I didn't know how to talk to them. And um, I'm teasing you though because it does. Well, no, it's the truth. Memorial is we aren't doing our own marketing, and we're missing a moment there that logistically needs to happen about September, October. We need to get on the schedule now. To hold us to hold up to remind us that by the August board meeting, we need to have reached out to legislators to find a date and they can meet with us. And it may be that, that they different legislators come from different areas and they come to that local library. They don't all have to come to Mecca to understand this library is in your community. This is what it's doing. And it can be an open house for the citizens as well. It says we're bored here to listen to what legislators are being told and so we can work with you on making it happen. If both sides aren't heard, um, there's no way that we can. There's there's no way we can come to any kind of solution that might work for all. I don't know if we can ever come to a solution that works for all, but uh -huh. you know, at least hands reaching across the aisle. At least you know you got to give a little, take a little, that kind of thing. 
um, so, thank you. Um, so the the final version of the bill that was passed by Senate and uh, the House, they had consulted with so ICFL, um, and that doesn't mean that they reached absolute consensus, but they, they did consult with them and made a lot of changes on that final bill. Um, and also, you know, something for us to consider is we're saying that, you know, they it's going to impact libraries, so the legislators should be consulting the libraries, um, but materials in the library potentially impact children and so we should be consulting the harms that are happening to kids because if the book is harmful it's harmful it doesn't matter how the kid gets it and we shouldn't be a part of giving harmful materials to children one of the things that i would like to point out again and it seems to be we're stepping around it a lot at this meeting is i was handed a flyer <clears throat> in front of post falls that had five books pictured on it um, all five of those books were from the YA department in Post Falls. All five of those books <clears throat> were, it was indicated that they were more sexually explicit than they should be in that department. All five of those books were for listed by the publisher for older teens, high school teens, or uh, um, all five of those books is exactly what our policy targets exactly what our policy is targeting. And so I'm not saying that that it, but that was simply the flyer. That's simply what I looked at. And then I looked at our policy and those are exactly the books. We are doing something. We, I mean, every single one of those books will be carefully looked at and it's decided. And if it's, if it is for older teens, it very likely will be moving into the adult department. That's what the policy does. And so there is there is consideration. We are looking at it. And when when I when that isn't that kind of when the policy is looked at as hollow and yet we are actually going to be looking at those books, don't know what else to say. Well, what what I hear you saying is is what I also agree with that when when you make statements that say that there's material in the library that's harmful to minors, we have to be very careful about what we mean by that, and also what if anything the library um, can or should do. And so this board passed the library card for minors policy in part. Um, due to what we saw um, happening with the legislature, so that so that we here could be responsive locally, and um, I, uh, um, on my own behalf, sent a copy of our library card for minors policy to um, legislators for their information. So, Rochelle, if you, so I guess what I'm saying is, when you make comments like that, you say it in such a way that we're not doing anything. And so if there is something that you want to see this board do, mm -hmm. it would be helpful to have concrete, um, you know, you, you need to be very concrete and specific rather than just saying, you know, we're doing something harmful. Well, I was just saying a general principle that, you know, we should be considering this. Um, and I don't know, it just seems like uh, I am not, well, that we, we disagree as a board. And so when I suggest things, they're a lot of times just uh, rejected outright because I had suggested something like a kid's card like a year and a half ago, um, like within the first six months of being on the board. And I was told that it can't be done. Um, but now it's a wonderful idea because you guys came up with it. Um, but, you know, it just, I was just saying a general principle. We should consider the effects on children, not just how it affects the library. Was that a conversation that you had with our director? Because I had no idea about a kid card. I 
I was not aware of a, of a kid card or a library district being implementing a kid card. And, and you know, maybe it's because I live under a rock or something. I don't know. But um, it was only when we started talking with the consultant and our recruiter that that came to the surface for me. So maybe you had that conversation separately with the director, but I have no recollection whatsoever of you ever telling this board, hey, you could adopt a library card for minors policy. You never approached this board with that suggestion. Um, no, actually, I, I didn't talk to the director about it. It was in uh, one of our board of trustee meetings, and uh, but it wasn't a full fledged idea. I mean, I didn't know that it already existed. I was just like throwing out an idea, like maybe we could do this, um, but I think I was told that legally we could not do it. Another piece of information. Another dilemma of misinformation then, because we did learn. Thank you for, I believe it was, well, uh, we both began to read about it, I think, and Katie, you commented on my last fall with me one time, and we were saying, what do we do? So that that uh, eventually we got there, maybe not as fast as you would like, but it is there and in place. And I think it's uh, one that legislators need to come to understand and our chance to teach them, share with them, they can do what they want with it, but at least we can share with our local legislators this is what's happened since the last legislative session. It's happening. So how do we, um, because I, I agree, I would like there to be more of a conversation happening with our local legislators. So, I mean, it's great that we're talking about it here at this board, mem board meeting saying, hey, we should do this, but, but how, how, how practically speaking are we going to move that goal forward? We've done this before. And we've we've had legislative presentations before, open and so houses. open houses kinds of things, out. and we can figure it out. Um, but it isn't impract it's not impractical, um, and it, I think it's become necessary. All right. And, and one of the ways to do that is sometimes we did a whole a, all of us did it at one time, and we often shared it. We did it in IC one time because we were talking about libraries. Mm -hmm. And the coordination we all do. But as I think about the geography, maybe now when we have so many community library sense to it, that all the legislators can be invited, but as long as one local one comes to have an open house, do what we're doing, meet with the staff, look at the books, and talk with us about it, and us to listen. Um, in an hour, I'll bet we could, could uh, Physically have them in the library. First step is, is any, any of those legislators in the library? And if not, what do we miss that they didn't get in there? So I think some things can happen, which is a dilemma because it means there's more meetings for us to happen if we've got a bunch of legislators to reach. Uh, maybe we can combine that somewhat. But, but we need to get on their calendars because by fall, their calendars begin to get full and they're gone by December 1st, configuration of the legislature, and in session in January. But they're starting to write their legislative pieces and submitting them in the fall. So for us to help them understand what's happening, it's September, October. And it may take two months to catch everybody along the way. Now, I know we're focusing on budget till August when we have a budget hearing. But uh, it sounds like everybody's willing to fire up the momentum to what I highlight now. Thank you. OK, that sounds good. Um, I have it on the front of my list to do. Community announcements. Um, do say we do. We have 15 minutes, and I do want to save some time for spe setting special meetings. Um, but if there are no community announcements, the next section is a public comment overview. I'd love to say something about that. Okay. Um, it's absolutely not true that any decisions the board has made recently has to do with the upcoming elections. And I'm speaking, I don't, I'm not even up for election, but when people sit at this or stand at the podium and say that we've made decisions because of the upcoming elections, it really, really bothers me. And it should bother everybody. Because it's absolutely, we've been working on nonstop, but we've been working and getting things done and working for months to get things that just got done. Um, also, um, perfect example, the one speaker today uh, went to a library 
and asked for a kid's card. And it's like, I believe he even said, I watched your, the video of the meeting and it says there's a kid's card and I went to get that kid's card and it's not there. Well, he didn't watch much of it because we talked about the implementation of it in detail. Um, so these people that come in and have a quarter of the information and think they know everything, it just, it really gets to me as a trustee for all of us. And for not just the trustees, but the staff. So that's what I want to say about that. And I wanted to, uh, Lindsay, I know you've been thanked several times for stepping into the director's position right now, <laughs> but you've not only just stepped in, you have kept up with the work that a sitting director would be doing right now. And you're not even, I mean, you're expiring pretty soon, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> But you haven't just sat in a chair. You've done the work, and it's impressive. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there a round of applause? And Janelle, of course, and everybody and else that supports you. <laughs> <laughs> because I know it's been a. It's a team. It is. Yes. Okay. Um, so, anybody else? All right. All right. Then the next I item. I have one more. Okay. Um, you're right. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, it's painful, uh, but most importantly, as a board member, I stand it. What I don't want to ever happen is comments like that made to our staff. And part of our board responsibility is to shield that maybe case. I'm happy to do that too. But some of the things that said today were very inaccurate, and uh, I think. Uh, degrading to people uh, who are willing to do public service. Uh, and we're seeing that, I think, in many legislative issues. And that's just not good for our society and our culture. And that's not what our libraries represent. And so I would highlight to our board that, that we need to be sure to tend to our staff when having meetings without the hard work that the staff does. And although I, I you know, first I found that. Um, Painful. That doesn't deter me. But then these folks that are in the trenches every day, it worries me a lot. Yeah. Um, OK, thank you. Um, I'm going to skip down to set special meeting and regular special and regular meeting dates. Um, the first item that we have to talk about is a budget hearing, and that is in August. And do you have a date for that? And don't we have a, a special? We come to consensus for our other meeting dates, but this budget hearing is a is a requirement that will require a. Uh oh, we don't. Have, yeah, we do have action item. Yes, thank you. Um, it is August tenth at five thirty at Post Falls. So um, what I need is a motion saying that we would like our budget hearing on this date at that time and where. OK, so I'll make the motion. Um, and this is a, a budget hearing. OK, I move that we um, have a budget meeting hearing hearing mm -hmm. for fiscal year. Do I have to put that in? Uh -uh. OK, well, uh, yeah, that's a good idea. Fiscal year I 24. Yeah, fiscal year 24 um, on August 10th at the Post Falls Library. Yes. Not at 9 a.m. at 5.30. At 5.30. <laughs> okay, it's been moved to have our budget hearing on uh, for um, the budget for FY24 on August 10th, 2024, 5.30 p.m. at Post Falls, right? Mm -hmm. Any discussion on that? Um, is there a reason to not have it right after the seventh, the meeting on August seventeenth, just since we're already there? Yeah, I remember. Yeah, there's a reason. There, it, yeah, it has to be like a week before. Like, oh, go ahead. Gotcha. Okay. okay. It it doesn't have to be a week before, but we had um, budget hearings um, the same day as a regular meeting, and then went right into. 
um, approving the budget without um, giving time for the board to consider the public comment mm -hmm. at the hearing. That's what so, we did. We staged it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any more comment? All right. It's been moved to set our budget hearing for August for the FY24 budget for August 10th, 2024. It couldn't be 24. Is it 24? Yeah. For fiscal, fiscal year 24. Yeah. Fiscal year 24 on uh, oh, August 10th, 2023. Sorry. Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, 5.30 p.m. at Post Falls. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, then the next two dates that we have, Judy said she's out of town next week. But nevertheless, yeah, nevertheless, we um, we have a um, the let me let me get my calendar out. My concern is that we are going to get that get some information back. Right, you need to take action, and we need to sure. um, approve that. Um, approve that. Can I call in on something like that if I'm able to? Do yes, you are able to call in as a looking at the open meeting law, you are able to call in. Um, so, um, I asked our candidate to get back to us on the 24th. I'm not sure that they would. Um, but um, next week. so next week we could either do like the 25th, the 27th. Wednesdays are terrible for me, 25, 27 or 28. Um, and we could hold times before because we don't know if we're going to, be, you know, um, what our day is looking like for everyone. I'd say a little bit later in the week might be helpful. Any chance you get the candidate will get back just before the 24th? There's certainly always a chance, but I have no idea. What we asked for 24. I said, yeah. 20, I asked, I asked for 20. I'm open Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Okay, so Thursday, but not Tuesday. Wednesday. Oh, uh, you asked. I did. Uh, yeah, I'm open Tuesday. Okay. Um, what do you get? What are your druthers? I'm open all days. Anybody else? Um, I'm okay, except on like Thursday later in the day would be better. Do you guys want to set Thursday two to four? Let's, just, let's do two dates. Let's do two dates. Let's get that on. Two dates like Tuesday two to four and Thursday two to four, that thing? That way we, whatever we can do, we don't have to reschedule if something didn't work. Can you hold those? Sure. What you're doing is holding two to four on the 25th and two to four on the 27th. So depending on the candidate, Getting back to us? Yes. Okay. Give us some lead time. Um, then then I want then I want you guys to look for the following week and this one we can set. Mm -hmm. And that is to look at this budget that these that this staff is can't wait to get and bring <laughs> <laughs> do for us. Would you like to go Thursday the fourth on that? Late in the day, I can't see that. That doesn't work for you. What about the second or the fifth? I would vote the fifth. Yeah, just that's because just that we need a little bit of time. Yeah, I would think that that would work. Which way you go? Five, which is Friday. Friday is okay. Time. But two to four again. I mean, I say two to four, but it could be one to three since it's Friday. One to three. One to three. Okay, so okay. this one is this one's the on thirty. What? Do we count from my is it we're gonna meet in post falls? I'm gonna try to make it be in post falls, yes. Right. I have a commitment till one. One fifteen. So two to four. Okay, two to four will work. I'm sorry, you you were headed for one. That's fine. Does one thirty is one thirty? I vote for one thirty. Yeah, okay. I do. Let's too. do it. Okay, one thirty to 3.30, and this is going to be, this is true. This is this is not a hold it. This is, this is, an ink. This is a special meeting, and we're all in consensus on that, yes? Yes. Special meeting, 1.30 to 3, this will be budgeting. This will be about budget. 
Will we have some material sent to us earlier then? Maybe uh, not. <laughs> it, it, it's hard to it, it's hard to say. We yeah, we'll do our best. This is a crunch for them, you know, and it will be a ballpark. It will be a ballpark look, but it's really sure. important that we start moving yeah. on this. And possibly post falls, or it is post falls. Oh, that's right. If it's not post falls, you will be notified. Right. We're going to try to do. We're going to try to make them at post falls, and we know that we can meet in the workroom. Mm -hmm. and, that's right. And mm -hmm. you know, but that doesn't. There are times when both when everything's full and. We can't meet anywhere. The director's office used to be the board meeting room when it was, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh, way back. <laughs> okay. All right. Then at this point in time, our next meeting is on May 18th from 9 to 12 in Rastrum. Another early morning meeting. We're excited. Is it till 1230? Oh, 1230. They're all till 1230 now. So the afternoon went away and the morning was supposed to be okay. All regular meetings will add 30 minutes for public comment until mm -hmm. further notice. Just so we can, it, one of the absolute positive, I, for all the things that are said about us and all that stuff, thing that was profoundly frustrating to me that the month before, but last month especially, was that we could not get our work done. And that was, I, I, when I tried to pare it down, I was like, was it what was said was that was like, no, we couldn't get our stuff done. So, and all right. So with that, we're done. Adjournment? I move that we adjourn. Okay, it's been moved. We adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Opposed? No. <laughs>